Hello everyone, Ronan here, and I hope you're excited, because I sure am. When this story first started, I said it was a milestone. And now, as we bring the second season to a close, and officially end what we are calling the Crimson and Black Saga, meaning I can now bring this collaborative project to an end, I'm super hyped for all the progress that I've been able to make with all the people that have been involved. All right, all right, relax, Rowan. Sure, our bit is done, but it's not like you and I are off the clock completely. I mean, what's come to be affectionately known as the GSA universe is still an ever-growing and evolving beast all its own. May, or Max, sponsored by Team Magma, is still going very strong. We'll continue the story of Ash directly from where this finale leaves off. You're right, the journey is definitely far from over, but before we go any further, I'm gonna need you guys to do the usual YouTube stuff. Don't forget to drop a like and a comment on the video and subscribe to all the channels that have been involved with the GSA universe. And you guys know this is a finale, so make sure to stick around to the very end because you're gonna get a first-hand look at the future of the GSA verse and everything we have in store for you because this is gonna effectively be What If Giovanni Sponsored Ash Season 3. But for now, please enjoy the fruits of everyone's hard work. A terribly tense night has passed since the disastrous battle between Ash and AJ. In the aftermath, AJ has been hospitalized with several injuries, while his Sand Slash and other Pokemon have been confiscated with ironclad evidence of Pokemon abuse. As for Ash, his abrupt departure has caused just as much of an upset, with many having questions such as how did he suddenly teleport away? Was he responsible for Sand Slash's berserk outburst? And what strange events must have transpired for this boy who Lance assured everyone was killed on New Island to return? To allay all these fears, along with many others, a televised panel is being hosted by Mr. Goodshow, with Lance, his Elite Four, and the visiting champions all sitting in to give their opinions on the competition as a whole so far. And of course, the infamous battle that closed out the prelim round. By design, the conversation starts out in a light and breezy manner, touching on conference highlights, such as Gary's spectacular victory with his Dragonair in the final round, or the impressive performance of newcomer and relative Dark Horse Asunta. However, the topic does inevitably turn to the most recent battle, with Lance wasting no time in condemning the act of wanting violence that ended the match, and apologizing to all viewers at home who might have been distressed by the sight. He also makes every assurance that the Sand Slash in question has been safely detained, and that AJ is receiving treatment for his injuries. In a casual tone, Karen adds that there really is nothing to worry about, as the doctors say that the only permanent injury the boy has received is to his whipping arm. Hardly a tragedy, and that Sand Slash returned to normal mere moments after it had begun to maul his trainer. Nodding thoughtfully, Alder comments that this latter point is indeed peculiar, asking if anyone has any insight as to why the ground type experienced what he can only call momentary insanity. It seems Lance has something to say to this, but he is not given the chance, as once more, Karen speaks up, replying that she spoke to the Saffron City gym leader, and one of Kanto's preeminent psychics and heroes, Sabrina, and according to her, Sand Slash's actions clearly indicated outside interference, likely from a powerful esper. Coldly, Lorelai inquires as to whether she and Sabrina had this conversation before or after she stuck her tongue down the gym leader's throat. With a blithe confidence that says she will not be intimidated by the likes of the ice specialist, Karen replies that it was actually while they were taking a break between sessions, before teasingly suggesting that the redhead sounds jealous. Seeing the topic of Karen's love life as irrelevant to the conversation, Cynthia attempts to steer the discussion forward, asking if Sabrina had any theories as to where this interference might have come from. But before she can answer, Lance cuts in, refusing to be overlooked again, as he states that it was obviously Ash Ketchum's doing. In a neutral tone, Cynthia queries this accusation, asking how the Dragon Master figures that. And here, Lance pauses, his eyes darting briefly to Bruno and Lorelai. He knows they saw exactly what he did, those same glowing eyes as the monster Mewtwo. But to divulge that would mean admitting the possibility that his victory over the Abomination may not have been as absolute as he had claimed, as well as bringing back up the sticky subject of his choice to sacrifice the very boy he was accusing for the greater good, something he cannot allow as it would cause a panic among the people, and worse, a loss of the public favor even more drastic than when he lost his Johto title to Karen. Then his eyes fall on the third member of the Elite Four, Pierce, and the slightest hint of a smile curves the champ's mouth as he answers Cynthia, revealing that through his work as a G-Man, he uncovered that the boy is a Team Rocket asset, just like Mewtwo, working directly under Giovanni. And considering the similarities in Ash's newfound abilities and the power the artificial Pokemon exhibited on New Island, he is inclined to believe that the criminal syndicate may have conducted experiments on Ash to imbue him with psychic abilities. Throughout this little monologue, Lance's eyes never leave Pierce's, and in turn, the 
dark haired man meets his gaze without flinching. Both know the true significance behind this claim. As though Pierce has taken the position as the Enigma, all of his past accolades could not hide the truth from Lance, with the Dragon Master knowing exactly where he comes from. He also knows that Pierce bears the same blood as that redheaded brat Silver, and what better evidence could he ask for than that to prove that this man's blood will always show itself? Lance can trace his lineage through a long line of Dragon Masters and heroes all the way back to the noble Dragonoids, who saved the very world and is so destined to carry on that legacy. Meanwhile, Pierce is a scion of a criminal scum, and though he may attempt to claw his way out of the filth of his birth to attain the lofty position among the Elite Four, criminal scum is all he is fated to become, and when he shows his true colors, Lance will be waiting. For now, this is simply good unspoken leverage to have the man act in his favor, as the matter of the Ketchum boy is far more pressing. Taking heart from his leader's confidence, Bruno adds his voice to Lance's, saying Ash is the only logical candidate, since he was the only other person on the battlefield, and when they reviewed the tapes, he just vanished into thin air. If that doesn't prove he's a powerful psychic, nothing will. This causes the panelists to go quiet as each weigh what has been said. Lance obviously needs very little contemplation, as he has known from the moment the Ketchum boy turned up alive that he would have been a threat to law and order, with this incident merely being confirmation. Likewise, Lorelai and Bruno both simply intend to follow Lance's lead, that having served them well up until now, if he is just a pompous windbag. Across from them, Cynthia's brow is creased into a frown. While she recognizes the evidence that Lance and his allies have presented is circumstantial at best, it is still the most plausible acting theory, so for now, she will accept it, though she will keep her eyes and mind open for new evidence that may change this perspective. Next to her, Karen's thoughts could not be more different. From the start of the conference, she despised that little snot AJ and his obsession with strong Pokemon, as it is completely antithetical to her philosophy of what a trainer should be. But putting that aside, she trusts Sabrina and Sabrina trusts Ash. So she is willing to put her faith in her girlfriend's friend and hope that whatever strange circumstances the boy has found himself in, he will use his gifts for good rather than evil. In a similar vein, Alder feels that Sanslas's actions were more or less warranted after the abuse that it had faced. And if this Ash Ketchum fellow looked out for Sanslash's best interests, well then, he can't be all bad. Then, there is Pierce. As ever, he remains an enigma, though his support lies firmly with Ash as the one who took down Giovanni. Meanwhile, in a location it seems the entire world would like to know, the entity who bears Ash Ketchum's face and Mewtwo's power watched the discords via a large screen, which had last been used to send the now defunct rocket admins on their training trips around the world. Unfortunately for the Amalgam, the panelists on this screen are not his only critics, as some of Ash Ketchum's Pokemon have begun showing their displeasure with this unnamed stranger's failed attempts to fill in for the boy who won their loyalty and affection. Veteran and matured members of the team like Kingdra and Fira exhibit this by vehemently refusing to sync up with and properly obey his orders, while the younger, more rowdy powerhouse members like Psyduck, Charizard, and Crocodile make no attempt to settle disobedience, instead openly voicing their displeasure. This is where we find the entity formerly known as Ash Ketchum hearing out the complaints of the latter trio, so to speak, as they bear down upon him, attacks ready. Being the most headstrong of the group, Charizard is the first to act, letting loose his strongest fire blast, while a half second later, Crocodile reads himself in a dark flame-like energy to combo with his rival, and make the imposter take their displeasure seriously. In response, the amalgam demonstrates the strength he inherited from Mewtwo, by dodging the torrents of light and darkness before simply snapping his fingers to tear the ground beneath him and blow both red reptiles away. His eyes then flash blue, causing Crocodile and Charizard to be slammed into opposing walls, with force strong enough to shake the reinforced steel surfaces. However, what once was Ash is not the only one here who has been blessed with telekinetic powers, as with surprising speed and force, the scattered pieces of floor that converge on the boy, forming a tight cocoon that imprisons him up to his neck. Impressive. The mashed up entity had not expected Psyduck to unleash so much raw stocking power in direct confrontation, and thus, feels compelled to be a bit more serious when he pushes back, first freeing himself and then reminding the foul of the gap between it and its Esper mentor, the great Mewtwo. Briefly, Psyduck attempts to stand against the storm of psionic energy radiating out from the boy, but even he is no match, falling forward with the force of gravity increased on it, as the entity states that this entangled with Giovanni's star pupil has truly unlocked the clone's limiters, making him the ultimate weapon incarnate. Telepathically, the entity then reaches out to all of Ash's Pokemon, asking in a tired, almost pained tone if anyone else wants to contest him for leadership of this party. Naturally, he receives no response, as those not vanquished will either take this as a warning to rethink their strategy, or begrudgingly fall in line as Blossom and Hitmonlee have done. 
Either way, he continues reminding the group that he is not acting out of ambition or to fulfill his own designs, but to carry on the inherited will of all those they held dear and who now tragically are gone. However, such an undertaking is not one he can complete alone, even with his supposedly enviable power. So for the sake of Ash's dream, he's asking them all to help him. Please! Hearing that the entity is trying to honor Ash, the Pokemon slowly begins agreeing, and thanks to his powerful telepathy, the boy does not need Meowth to translate for him. Come to think of it, the Scratchcast voice is the only one of Ash's Pokemon he doesn't hear. Reaching out to the only other non-Pokemon here in the base with him, they telepathically ask Jesse and James if they have seen Meowth lately. At once, they both reply with a staunch no, the fear tinting their thoughts, being enough to convince him that they are not lying. Though, the question still remains, where is Meowth? With a groan, the Scratch Cat finally steps foot in the Indigo Plateau Pokemon Center. On his short legs, it had taken him over a day to get back here from Viridian City after he and the new management had teleported there following their match with AJ. Even though he was proud to be strong enough to make such a journey so quickly, he never really wanted to do it again. It had been an arduous trek but he owes it to his boss to fill in his friends on what's going on, having spotted them in the crowd during the battle. Being dinner time, the tired and hungry Meowth makes his way to the cafeteria, and luckily for him, Brock, Misty, Silver, Richie, and Gary are all together, seated around the table, making the normal type smile that finding them had been a piece of cake. Man, he could really go for a piece of cake right now. No, focus. This is for the boss. His mind made up, Meowth then strides towards the group, or at least he thinks he does, as truthfully, it is more of a woozy stagger born of fatigue and famishment. Seeing this, Brock bolts up, catching the cat and bringing him over to the table, concerned to his tone as he asks what Meowth is doing here. Putting on a brave face, the Scratch Cat answers that he's here to help them, but with a frown, Misty retorts that it looks like he can barely help himself, let alone them, urging him to have some food and something to drink first. Eagerly, Meowth accepts, packing away more food than a Pokemon of his size feasibly should be able to do, while making the group of heroes glad that all of the meals are free for the Pokemon League participants. Finally, when he has eaten enough to not look like he is about to keel over, Meowth begins to explain everything that has happened after the raid. How the person he only refers to as New Management took him, Jesse, James, and all of the other Pokemon who had been experimented on with the new R drug Giovanni had been stockpiling into hiding at the underground base in the Viridian Gym. Silver comments that it's an oddly ingenious move, taking up residence in a place Interpol already raided, and so won't feel the need to check again. Nodding, Meowth says this was the new guy's thinking, before adding that ever since then, he's been trying to win over both Ash's Pokemon and the Pokemon from the base who he has started calling Shadow Pokemon for some grand plan he has. Giving the cat a piercing look, Gary asks what this grand plan is, but with a shrug, Meowth replies that he doesn't know. It's not like the new management confides in him or nothing. Honestly, he doesn't even get why he keeps him around, since he can talk to Pokemon just fine on his own with telepathy, and he's always been far from from Ash's strongest. Hearing the pain in Meowth's voice, Richie speaks up, asking if he's alright. With a deep melancholy sigh, Meowth answers that he's lost one of the best friends he's ever had, while some stranger keeps squaring his face. How does the kid think he feels? A subdued air hangs over the group after this claim, with Brock nodding that they all feel the same way, and that they're still here for him. Smiling weakly, the normal type thanks the young man, before asking if he can see that Professor Oak guy, since he was thinking if anyone knows what's going on, it'd be him, since he did have that telepathic chat with Ash right before the raid. Nodding, Gary says he's just napping up in his room, but for something like this, he doesn't think his grounds will mind being woken up. A few minutes later, the team are assembled in Professor Oak's room. After a short introduction, followed by the curious old man suddenly becoming as sharp as a knife as he examines Ash's aberrant partner he'd been so excited to meet. When Oak's initial curiosities are satisfied, Meowth recounts the same story he did to the kids downstairs. Throughout the story, Delia looks as though she is going to burst into tears at any moment, while Oak appears to be trying his very hardest to focus, an evidently difficult feat. Finally, when Meowth finishes, he asks the old man what exactly he said to the boss right before the raid, and with a tired sigh, Oak explains that he was warning Ash about the dangers of bonding too closely with the legendary Pokemon. Simply put, humans are not meant to possess the power of legends. He then admits that there is something he's been keeping from them all. For several decades now, he has been bonded with the legendary Pokemon Mew, and while he has learned so much from his partnership with the progenitor Pokemon, it has come at a heavy cost, eating away at both his lifespan and his mind. At once, his recent deterioration makes sense, with Gary asking why his grandpa would choose something so dangerous. But with a self-deprecating chuckle, the professor answers that he guesses his curiosity got the better of him. He saw a chance to acquire knowledge that no one had before him, and he took it, heedless of the risks. 
Though it pains him to admit it, he was an arrogant fool. It's a simple and very convincing story, but Silver doesn't buy it, fixing the old man with a searching gaze similar to Looker's as he accuses this story doesn't add up. If he did all this for the sake of learning stuff, why do it in a way that risks his sanity, since if he went cuckoo before he could finish his research, it would all be pointless. Nodding approvingly, Oak praises Silver's shrewdness, saying he's right. Originally, his bond with Mew was a loose enough one that he would likely never lose his mind entirely, even if his lifespan would be somewhat diminished. But then, something came up where he needed more of Mew's power, and so he traded the only thing of value he had left to offer. Feeling annoyed with his grandpa for doing this to himself, for doing this to their family, and to him, Gary asked what could possibly be so important that he'd give up the most precious thing in the world to him. But with a soft smile, Oak responds in a single word, you. He then explains that it was the night of the New Island incident. Mew had told him that Giovanni had taken Gary and the others prisoner, on top of the findings it made on the attempts to clone it. So, he had accepted his partner's gift of power, the power he hoped to save them all. Though when he arrived, those clever boys had already freed themselves. All he could do in the end was save Ash and Mewtwo from death at the hands of Lance and the legendary birds. Though in doing so, he set them down a path very similar to his own. And so ever since then, he's been trying to help them however he can to avoid his fate. Another failure on his part, so it seems, as his current hypothesis is that the amalgamation between Ash and Mewtwo shall be forced to pay an even heavier price. Perhaps it's not too late, a calm voice suggests, though not one belonging to anyone in the room's inhabitants. Looking around, they see Ash, or rather, the person who before the raid had been Ash, materialize beside the professor, as he says that he does not still fully understand what he is, but with the old man's knowledge and experience, maybe he can figure it out. Then he requests to talk alone, willing to admit his fear of approaching the most knowledgeable person in the life of what he once was, though feeling rather protected of his gramps after the revelation of what he sacrificed for him, Gary resolutely states that he's not leaving him alone with a stranger. Still in his calm voice, the Revenant asks if Gary really thinks he has a choice, and while there is no threat to his tone, everyone is smart enough to read between the lines. Instinctively, Gary reaches for Blastoise's Pokeball as a sign that he is willing to press this issue with his former rival, but in a placent tone, Oak tells his grandson not to worry, before gladly taking hold of the newcomer's arm and allowing him to teleport them both away. A moment later, the pair appear in the corral at Oak's lab, the veil of night giving the place a new dynamic seldom seen by outsiders. Seeing who is here, a small pink feline flies over to greet Oak, and as the professor scratches Mew fondly from behind the ears, he comments that Ash always loved this place, to which the amalgam solemnly nods, confirming that he truly did. Looking the newcomer in the eyes now, Oak asks who he really is, if not Ash, to which the entity answers that he has no name, being merely the gray area between between Ash and Mewtwo, giving him a friendly look, Oak addresses him as Mr. Grey Area, a decision so comically odd, yet so like the man the entity remembers from Ash's boyhood that he finds himself smiling for the first time in his new lifetime. Feeling as though the professor might be the only one who truly understands him due to his bond with Mew, the entity begins to open up, explaining that he was speaking the truth when he said he has no malicious intentions towards Ash's friends. He is merely here to keep the boys promised to battle them at the League. Nodding, Oak says that Gary already told him the young man is going around fulfilling Ash's promises, though he also said that he had his own plans for afterwards. Despite his impulse to trust Oak, on this matter, the amalgam remains cagey, only going so far as to reveal that in the time he has left, he wishes to leave this world better than as he found it. Worriedly, Oak comments that better be a subjective ideal, his tone making it clear that after the Sand Slash incident, he has his doubts about the entity's concept of morality. However, the being tells the old man that he is not so different, as to have lost his heart, and that if he trusted Ash, then he should trust him as well, since while the boy is no longer here, the world he means to create is one he knows Ash Ketchum would be happy with. Sighing, Oak agrees, stating that his intent is the same as it ever has been, to provide help and guidance, a claim which pleases the young amalgam, who says there is one matter in particular that only the professor can help him with. Back at the Indigo Plateau, the waiting is interminable. With the heroes all struggling to sit still, nothing about this makes sense or feels right. And as the minutes tick over, the small room becomes more and more of a powder keg, just begging for something to set it off. Finally, after a bit over an hour, Oak and his questionable companion return, appearing just as they departed. Concerned in his voice, Gary asks if his gramps is okay, but the professor smiles that he's just fine, though he would quite like to return to his nap. Giving the old man a curt nod, the entity states that in this case, he will not stay, gesturing for Meowth to join him. 
by the look on his face, the Scratch Cat is not enthused by this prospect, a fact Richie notices as he kindly tells the normal type that he doesn't have to go and that he can stay with them if he wants. Shaking his head, Meowth sighs that it's kind of a kid to say so, but like it or not, if there's any piece of his boss left in the world, it's with that guy. So as long as that's true, he ain't gonna turn his back on him again. So trudging over to the stranger, Meowth nods that he's ready to go. But before the pair can teleport away again, Brock stops them, saying he has something for the trainer formerly known as Ash. He then presents him with Bergmite, a decision which causes uproar among the others, who ask how Brock could possibly think giving a baby Pokemon to this guy is a good idea. However, Brock simply replies that it's Breeder's intuition. Ever since the rocket raid, Bergmite hasn't been himself. So perhaps, by going back to his real trainer, he'll be able to find the part of himself that's missing. And though he doesn't say it, everyone can hear the secondary hope, that perhaps the stranger will do the same, finding whatever remains of Ash in his heart. With this said, the stranger and his Pokemon depart, leaving silence in their wake. As the heroes prepare for bed, they are left to wonder if they have made a terrible mistake by allowing their former friend to walk free. Thankfully, the following day is a scheduled day of rest, designed to allow the finalists in their Pokemon to be in top shape for the remaining battles. Though after their encounter last night, none of our heroes are in the mood for relaxing, instead redoubling their training for the inevitable confrontation with the person who once was Ash. As it turns out, they will not have to wait long, as when they all assemble that evening to see who their top 16 opponents are, Misty receives a familiar shock to see that she has been slated to battle her former companion. The sun shines brightly over Indigo Stadium the next morning, though for Misty, it may as well still be the deepest night, as none of the sun's warmth is able to penetrate the chill that fills her as she stares across the pitch at him, his face as as impassive as ever, though when he sees her, he gives her the slightest of nods, an acknowledgement of the history she and Ash shared, knowing that now will be her best chance to say her piece, Misty calls to the stranger using her friend's name, when it is clear she has his attention, she tells him that each time they part ways, they will always reunite with the battle. And though we beat her both times before, she's going to win this one as her way of honoring Ash. The Revenant's only response is a nod, but for the first time, it allows its lips to shift upwards in a reserved smirk, but it of genuine mirth. Understanding or even approval Misty does not know, though now it is not the time to ponder it as Brock, who has agreed to serve as the referee, thanks for being friends with both trainers, tells them each to bring out their first Pokemon so the battle may commence. At this call, Misty is the first to unveil her Pokemon, wanting to set the tone of this battle and prove that she is still the one that is running this water ballet as she brings out Poliwrath, hoping the sight of him will pull upon Ash's memories. A moment later, the ambitious grappler appears in a flash, stealing his nerves as he faces down his former trainer once again and even throwing a jab that wishes the air menacingly as a clear sign he means to give the imposter his all. However, to Misty's horror, the amalgam proves once once again that he is not Ash, as instead of bringing out Psyduck to meet her challenge, he releases Hitmonlee, who touches down on the randomly assigned grass battlefield with a rather literal spring in his step. Then that small smirk grows wider as a mischievous glint appears in the imposter's eye, making his face truly appear like Ash's as he teases that if she attempts to treat him like what he once was, it will not end well, as he is an entirely new entity, meaning she must cast aside any preconceived notions that she is battling Ash and face him like she would any new opponent. He then calls for Hitmonlee to attack, an oddity in that he actually verbalizes the command, though this is hardly Misty's biggest concern, as Hitmonlee plants a hand on the ground while his coiled legs seem to pump energy and blood en masse, only to spring from its crouched position a moment later with explosive speed in a blitz Misty quickly recognizes as Double Edge. Polyrath is therefore forced to endure at least this before Misty can switch him out, but as a payment for this pain, she recognizes the open this attack creates, telling Starmie to use Reflect in the split second after it is called forth to create a psionic barrier between itself and the opponent. Due to appearing where Polyrath had just been, this causes the battle barrier to burst up right in front of Hitmonlee, sending the fighting type rebounding and springing off of the wall as white bioelectricity crackles around its limber body, courtesy of the double edge's recoil damage. In a showing of reckless indifference, Hitmonlee shrugs this off, seemingly drawing strength from the pain rather than letting it weaken him. A fact which his trainer explains is a gift of his ability reckless. Not for the first time, Misty can't help but to think Ash is one of the most talented trainers she has ever known, and now with the power of the world's strongest Pokemon on his side, he poses a real threat. Nonetheless, she has no intention of giving up, since maybe if she can just win this battle, she can bring him back to who he used to be. 
Meanwhile, Ash and Spectre has called for a second double edge, with the resultant clash of Hitmonlee's current high-speed blur for body coming in for a missile dropkick which allows it to break through the reflect and wallop Starmie, sending it spinning into the air like a shuriken. To the starfish's great credit, it deftly rights itself in midair, and even manages to grab hold of Hitmonlee with psychic energy, allowing Misty to follow up with a flurry of bubble beams and flashes to slow the kicking thing down and lower its accuracy. However, in a chiding voice, the amalgam calls his strategy useless, as he finally gives a telepathic command to his now overstimulated comrade, instructing him to close his eyes and perform a rolling kick which creates enough force to spin the bubbles off of himself, before leaping outside of the small whirlpool and landing beside his train with a grunt. Wanting to give the kicking Pokemon a rest, the young man prepares to swap him out for Ash's Blossom, or that is his intent at least. Though refusing to give up her advantage, Misty has Starmie quickly ride the swirl of bubbles upwards using Rapid Spin, which allows it to get enough height over Ash's Hitmonlee that the Water Specialist is sure her next move won't miss. All Hitmonlee can do is brace himself, as a Hydro Pump drives him into the grassy battlefield, creating a crater, with Misty believing she has successfully outwitted the telepath at last. However, this jubilation is premature, because Hitmonlee loses the final strike, a high jump kick through the torrent of Water that strikes Starmie head on and sees it unable to keep itself aloft. So, as both Pokemon fall back to the newly made pool in the center of the grassy field, they float unconscious as a pair, and Brock declares them both unable to battle, praising Hitmonlee's tenacity as his return. The amalgam next silently chooses a Velocity, who begins to rhythmically glide and dance in anticipation for her opponent. Who, in this moment, Misty chooses as Gyarados, trusting in the bond she's made with it as the new true ace of her team. However, this matchup is the exact opposite of the Leviathan squabbles with Ash's reptilian rival duo as when Misty calls for a Prento Dragon Dance in hopes of speeding her sea server up, she is impeded by Blossom's own dancing, which speeds up into her own signature Pretty Poison technique. This unfortunately forces Misty to change tact, as she must now prioritize keeping her Pokemon healthy over buffing their stats, with Gyarados being told to leap back and thrash around with Aqua Toad to disturb the toxic gases swirling around the gorgeous flowers dancing, with it doing so just in time to avoid being poisoned itself, while clearing away the Pretty Poison. Once again, the Amalgam has to praise Misty, as while he is a different individual from Ash Ketchum, the boy's Pokemon and their habits remain the same, meaning she boasts a firm grasp of both. Agreeing with this, as her confidence swells like a tidal wave, she orders Gyarados to go on an Ice Fang frenzy, as the Sea Serpent strikes and slithers with elongated Frosty Fangs, freezing up the grasslands with each pass or miss bite, quickly cornering the grass type who is forced to flee while leaving Moonblast in her wake to cover herself. However, little does Misty and Gyarados know that Bellossom is actually luring the Leviathan in, so that when there is only a single patch of grass left to stand on, she can turn Misty's counteroffensive back on her, using this moment to trap Gyarados in a furious petal dance that causes it to cry in pain. Desperately, the atrocious Pokemon attempts to sink its fangs into the flower, only for them to clash against the sharp petal storm, dealing more damage to itself in the process, while down below, Misty screams her pride and belief in the old old powerhouse of her family, urging it to stay strong. This encouragement allows the Sea Serpent to push itself beyond its limits, overcoming its single-minded use of physical power in order to raise its head high and summon a hurricane around itself. Sadly, this only triples the speed of the pedal dance, but in the process, the winds are far too harsh for Bellossom, carrying her into the air so that when Gyarados crashes down to the ground with swirls in her eyes, Bellossom is crushed underneath it. In this moment, the crowd goes wild for Misty, as the vaunted most talented young gym leader in the region has now set herself as the Knight of Shining Armor meant to slay the villain of the league that Ash Ketchum has begun to be billed as. With the match now down to Misty's fan favorite Poliwrath from the prelims and whatever Pokemon the intense S has up in his sinister sleeve. This turns out to be none other than a measly Psyduck, which only sees the crowd growing more rowdy as they cheer harder for Misty to crush the dopey duck and knock the weird jerk out of the competition. Wanting to quell some of the zeal before it boils over into a riot, Brock announces that this is the final bout of this match, while Misty, with a sense of relief, greets her former Pokemon, pleased that he and Poliwrath will get their rematch after all. Despite the crowd clearly looking down on the duck, he maintains an intense and focused aura mirroring the amalgams and standing in stark contrast to the clueless Claude that Misty once had in her care. Without a word, Misty returns Poliwrath to the field, with the punching tadpole reasserting its vow along with its new trainer, while Psyduck and the boy wearing Ash's face respond in kind, as the latter asks the little duck to not hold back any longer, and show Miss Waterflower the fruits of their growth. Nodding resolutely, Psyduck then begins to burst with an evolutionary light as its full power is finally sanctioned for release, with a mighty Golduck soon taking his place, 
who hums with psionic power far beyond that of the pure water type. This sight leaves Misty shaken, partially out of pride at the pure, indisputable power her friend has reached, but also because this complete change in his demeanor serves as further evidence that what once was will never be again. Though she is not psychic like her opponent, something in her expression conveys this heartbreaking thought to Polyrath. Though like her, it only fuels his resolve, so that when he charges in with water pulses coating his fist for their surging strikes combo, they both put their entire heart and soul into the attack. Sensing the strength of their convictions, Ash's remnant psychically commands Golda to create a cocoon of psychic power to shield himself, with the foul doing so at the last second as the watery fist rained down upon it. Despite the dangers of close quarters combat, Misty has Polyrath stay right where he is, with the pair of them working to create an opening for a decisive blow, like Body Slam, that might be able to blow the duck back. Once again, speaking verbally out of respect, the Amalgam says that they won't run or dodge or fulfill Misty and Polyrath's wish, so the duo should come at them with everything they have. Upon hearing these words and the voice of Ash Ketchum, both pairs feel the power rising inside them, as their synchronicity hits higher levels than ever, with Polyrath condensing all his willpower and focus into his fist, while Saito unleashed the full power of his mind through the gem on his forehead in the form of a hyperbeam. Refusing to back down, Polyrath slams his focus punch into the beam, creating a clash of wills that re-establishes the sheer level of power the league competitors operate on. As the safety force feels protecting the crowd bursts into life again, due to the flash of raw energy that detonates and clouds the field in dust. The stadium's built-in fans then whir into action. As the dust settles, Golda carefully stands while holding an unconscious Polyrath aloft, before gently floating it over to Misty, who accepts her vanquished friend gratefully. Meanwhile, the creature resembling Ash steps up to join Golduck on the field, congratulating him on passing another major milestone in his psychic training, and draping one of the duck's now long arms over his shoulders to support him before returning it to his ball. As Misty trembles, staring at Polyrath's Pokeball, and feeling the last of the adrenaline from the most epic battle she's ever had leave her body, she finally recognizes the outstretched hand meant to help her stand. As the shadow of Ash smiles softly, and expresses his hope that the battle was one their lost friend could have been proud of. Rising to her feet, Misty nods as she sure it was, with the crowd erupting in a heartfelt cheer for the daughter of Cerulean, with some hearts even starting to sway as they attempt to reconcile what they've been told about Ash Ketchum with what they are currently seeing from him. In the chaos, the Amalgam makes a request of Misty, producing an Ultra Ball and bringing up King Tree, whom upon release regards the figure wearing its king's face coldly, having no love for what it considers to be a usurper. In light of this, Ash once again calls on Misty's help with one of his water types, asking if she wouldn't mind helping it train, as he knows Kingdra will excel far higher with her than it will under new management as Meowth likes to call him, turning and asking the Knight of the Sea to train hard and be ready for the real work when he calls for his help. For a moment, Misty hesitates, unsure of where her own heart currently lays, and whether Ash is truly inside this being, or if these are simply sweet nothings meant to lure her into hoping once again. But regardless, she has to know, and so agrees, being handed Kingdra's ball, and told to take good care of them until the day they can meet again. Then, without another word, the boy vanishes, returning no doubt to his lair at the gym. While with a flurry of emotions churning inside her, Misty heads for the locker room. Here, she is surprised to see her other companions waiting for her, with Silver, Gary, Richie, Miss Ketchum, and Professor Oak all praising her for such an impressive battle. Feeling disappointment well up inside her once more, Misty sighs that she just wished it was able to make a difference, since she thought if she battled with all her heart, she might be able to bring Ash back, not to mention this also marks the end of her league run. However, here, Oak smiles, kindly stating that she gives herself far too little credit, as while it may not be obvious, that battle made all the difference in the world. It's just like his old mentor Professor Rowan used to say, when every life meets another life, something will be born. Not quite sure what the man is getting at, or even if this is one of his lucid moments, Misty asks the researcher to elaborate, with Oak adding that this battle was a tapestry of bonds. First, there was the bonds between herself, Ash, and Brock, three companions whose care for each other has made them inseparable, no matter what fate has thrown their way. Then, there was the link Misty and Ash made through Polyrath and Golduck, two Pokemon who were only able to achieve their full potential when entrusted to the other. And speaking of trust, it is evident that through this battle, Misty had developed a similar bond with Ash's Revenant, considering the way he asked her to train his Kingdra. Scowling, Misty protests that she doesn't want a bond with the new guy. She wants her friend back. Though chuckling lightly, Oak replies that she oughtn't look so unfavorably upon this new relationship, as there may come a day when her influence on the Amalgam's heart proves more important than she can possibly imagine. Following this, Gary, Richie, and Silver all have their top 16 matches, though none are nearly as dramatic as Misty's. Despite having been eliminated from the competition, the water flower of Cerulean City sticks around to cheer on the boys alongside Brock, Oak, and Delia, watching as they advance into the top 8, and then the semifinals. Though they had not seen his top 8 battle, the boys have no doubt that Ash will be the remaining finalist, meaning that one of them will have to face him while the remaining pair battle each other. A few hours later, the matchups are revealed, with Silver being slated to battle Ash while Gary will face Richie. Wishing each other luck, the boys then split up, 
each needing to plan their respective strategies for tomorrow's battles. The next morning sees Gary and Richie facing off first, with Silver's match being scheduled for that afternoon and the title fight taking place tomorrow. For these battles, the fields will be league regulation, meaning no terrain to give either trainer an advantage, though more pressingly, they will each be full battles, a choice no doubt made to ensure that the league winner will truly be the very best. Meeting in the heart of Indigo Stadium, Gary and Richie start by wishing each other luck and agreeing to go all out, so that whoever advances to the finals is truly worthy of taking on either Silver or Ash. Then, with this out of the way, they return to their respective spots and bring forth their first Pokemon. For Gary, this is Rhydon, while Richie somewhat predictably summons Dune. Being the student of the Pyramid King, Richie wastes no time in setting his strategy into motion with calling for a sandstorm, though Gary is just as quick, having the queen of his team use stealth rocks to line the field with dragon stones before swapping directly into his king, Blastoise. Hitting the field with the roar, the tenacious tortoise scans around for its opponent. Though amidst the shearing grains of sandstorm, Dune appears as a fleeting mirage, there one minute and gone the next. Even so, Gary has his ace fire off an ice beam to take advantage of the quad effectiveness of the move, with the duo managing to turn a significant portion of the whirling sand to snow as Dune is flushed out and nearly taken out, with only a hasty swap from Richie being enough to save her. In her place, Richie brings out Dusa the Tangro, though the price of his change becomes immediately apparent as she is pelted by jagged stones that dig into her vines and cause her to flinch slightly for a moment. However, instead of pressing the opportunity to attack, Gary once more swaps, revealing his third Pokemon to be his Pidgeot, granting Dusa time to shred the shards using her precise control of the mass of vines surrounding her while simultaneously firing off an ancient power she'd perfected under the coaching of Regirock. As a result, Gary and his trusty old flyer are quickly forced to show their acrobatic skill using agility to weave and maneuver before the mighty bird sweeps low and assaults its slow moving foe with a super effective flying move. Screeching in pain, Dusa attempts to retaliate by lashing Pidgeot's wings with several of its dense blue vines. Though here too Gary has a counter, using Brave Bird to set the vines alight before coming back around to knock Dusa off of her feet. Considering how the tangled mass weighs almost 300 pounds, this is no mean feat, and as it comes crashing down on her back, it is with spirals in her eyes, giving the first victory of the match to Gary and Pidgeot. Unfortunately for them, this victory is short-lived, as when Doom returns to the field, it is able to eliminate Pidgeot in one fail swoop, evening the score and proving that the Desert Dragon has no rival in the air. However, instead of being bothered by this, Gary can't help but smile, as he knew that the second he took out Dusa, Richie would fall back on his start to win the day for him. Having known Richie a long time now, Gary has a pretty good read on how he thinks, and even if it's not as intuitive as Silver's perception, his talent for analysis tells him that if he can take out the other boy's ace, it will not only remove a major powerhouse from Richie's team, but also cripple his confidence, making the rest of the battle simply an exercise in mopping up. Subsequently, this becomes Gary's main objective, with him breaking out his Arcanine to outpace the flyer, though to his dismay, Richie swaps once again, going with Foxy this time. As this new clash begins, it takes very little time for Foxy to live up to its name, using her Volpine Wiles to confuse Arcanine, before coming in for a brutal volley of attacks that go undefended in the Lion Dog's befuddled state. Seeing this as a losing battle, Gary goes to recall his fire type, though just before he can, Arcanine proved just why he calls her Honey. Delivering a sweet surprise, she snaps herself free of confusion and chomps down the smaller canine's throat with Thunder Fang. At once, Gary's spirits are boasted by this turning of the tide, and so much to capitalize, Gary next orders a flame charge, his Arcanine looking majestic as her coat bursts into flames, though to her shock, when Foxy is hit, she does not crumble, instead drawing the flames into herself, extinguishing Arcanine's charge, then returning the attack as a powerful flamethrower, which bathes Arcanine and leaves her unconscious. Recognizing this as the ability flash fire, Gary next trusts in his blastoise, figuring that good reliable type matchup should be the perfect counter for Foxy's trickery. However, this is a double-edged sword, as he soon learns that as well as possessing fire type attacks, Foxy knows a grass type move specifically for handling water types, that being Energy Ball. Due to being less than a spry creature, Blastoise has no choice but to endure these hits before firing back with Hydro Bomb, dowsing the Fox Pokemon, leaving neither in a great state. Not wanting to be the first to lose his starter, Gary urges Blastoise to let loose a Deluge that will wash the fiery fox away. Though it seems Richie is similarly determined not to lose his lead, having Foxy create a giant full power Energy Ball which meets the Hydro Bomb in the middle of a field. For a moment, the two attacks press against each other, vying for supremacy, though when it becomes clear neither can best the other, 
They explode, fading into oblivion as equals, and sending shockwaves of force outwards to strike the two Pokemon that created them. With this comes a massive plume of black smoke, which obscures everything. Though when it fades a moment later, both Richie and Gary find their Pokemon lying unconscious, with the match being called a double knockout. This is a rather disheartening result for Gary, who sees this tie as a loss, though at least he still has one other old reliable to call upon, that being Rhydon, who takes Blastoise's place on the field just as Richie reveals Happy. It seems that Foxy is not Richie's only trickster, as almost at once Happy attempts to use Sleep Powder to take out Rhydon, remembering the rule that sleeping and fainting are treated as the same in this league. However, Unlike against Richie's Ninetales, Gary is prepared this time, proving his adaptability by having Rhydon use Drill Run. In contrast to its usual usage, this is not designed to attack, but rather to defend. As created an air current with her spinning horn, the Heavenly Drill is able to use her horn like a fan, blowing the powder back into Happy's face and causing it to fall victim to its own attack. With Happy now asleep and subsequently disqualified, Richie's next Pokemon is Diva, the Jigglypuff with the puffball looking laughably small next to Rhydon. Unfortunately, when Gary makes the mistake of snarkily commenting on this fact, he receives a glare that would make the bravest of folk quake in their boots as Diva expands herself and lets out an ear-piercing yell. For a moment, Gary thinks that this is the little fairy throwing a temper tantrum, only to watch on in horror a moment later as the scream manifests in a physical blast of air that strikes Rhydon, sending the nearly 300-pound pachyderm crashing back into the stadium wall. Though she manages to survive, Rhydon clearly looks a little dazed from this encounter, and so, deciding to recall her for later, Gary chooses to reveal his penultimate Pokemon, Hitmonchan. Though the fighting type is not as effective against the balloon Pokemon as scientists once believed, Hitmonchan does have one trick up its proverbial sleeve that it knows will deal a wallop, that being Bullet Punch. Using the enhanced speed the move provides, Hitmonchan rushes in and delivers a left hook to Diva's face, causing her to deflate slightly as she goes bouncing backward into the arena wall. Unfortunately, being such a spherical creature, Diva simply rebounds, coming back just in time to catch a second Bullet Punch in the face which sends her soaring into Richie's arms. Adding his newest friend's hair comfortingly, Richie tells her to take a break. Then, wanting a real match, Richie brings out Snipes for a Hitmon duel. However, it seems this duel will be short-lived, as like everyone else, Snipes finds himself being stabbed with rocks the moment he lands on the battlefield. Though unlike the others, the fact that they dig into his feet and tail prove particularly problematic, considering they are his primary tools for combat. Unfortunately, this is not the only problem Snipes has to contend with, as when a triple kit proves less than effective against his fellow fighting type, Hitmonchan uses the opportunity to grab Snipes by the tail and lift him off the ground. With nothing left to spin on, the handstand Pokemon finds himself rather helpless, as Hitmonchan spits a disgusting loogie at him, then casts him aside. Though it seems the intent behind this jobbing was far more sinister than a simple act of disrespect, as Snipes soon finds himself feeling rather woozy as a purple rash develops under his eyes. Knowing time is running out for Snipes, now that he has been poisoned, Richie tells him to throw caution to the wind and to use close combat, though as the sentient spinning top begins to rotate, there is a definite unsteadiness to its movements. This slight reduction in speed is all it takes for Hitmonchan to get up a protect, blocking the subsequent blows with his forearms, then bringing his own fist down for a foul play, which is more than capable of knocking out the little Hitmon top in its weakened state. Down to just Dune and Diva now, Richie returns his fairy type to the field, with instructions to use repeated disarming voices until Hitmonchan falls. However, Gary isn't about to just roll over and lose his fighting type, telling the persistent pugilist to counter each of those with bullet punch until it can reach Diva and take her down. And so begins a clash of wills, as Diva begins the cycle of blasting her opponent with pink tinged sound waves, only for him to coat his fist in a silverly glow and strike the attack, dissipating it as it moves forward. However, both Richie and Gary can see that this is not sustainable, as with each punch, Hitmonchan appears to be moving a little slower and striking with a little less force, so that when he finally stands before Diva, it is on wobbly legs with fists that seem to weigh a ton. All the same, Gary urges his friend to just punch the puffball one last time, and with a massive force of will, Hitmonchan does so, or rather, he tries, as while he does plant his blood fist on the fairy type's forehead, he lacks the strength to actually do any damage with the hit. Then as Diva utters a confused, huh? the gentle gust proves enough to knock Hitmonchan down, with the tired fighter falling on his side as his eyes become spirals. Still wanted to give Rhydon a chance to rest after Diva's previous attack, Gary goes to Dragon there despite the massive type advantage it will be at. Seeing this, Richie attempts to capitalize with another disarming voice volley, but here, Gary has a counter. 
telling Dragonair to use a combination of Iron Tail and Constrict to create a steel coil which wraps around Diva, pushing all the air out of her and preventing her from drawing any more in. Not only does this limit her ability to float or perform any of her other evasive tricks, it also prevents her from getting the air she needs for any of her sound-based moves. Understandably, this looks rather dire for the pink prima donna, though Giovanni did not call Richie brilliant for nothing. As without missing a beat, the auburn haired boy tells his friend that if she can't go big, to go small. The literally airheaded Pokemon gaining a new mischievous glint at her partner's suggestion before she sucks into further shrink in a crude recreation to minimize the slip away. Gasping in air, she's released that sees her puffing right back out as Gary regrets not calling for extreme speed rather than Iron Tail. The difference being Jigglypuff's resultant screaming death metal version of Sing going off point blank of the Drake's face while she is unable to cover her ears, causing the serpent to go immediately limp as she passes out of the puff's feet. Before Violet can count this as a knockout, Richie cheers his diva on to make some more noise, not really thinking about what he's asking for, as the noise causes the sleeping dragon to arrive. Diva's naturally disarming voice sending pink bioelectricity shooting up her light body. Worried for Dragonair's safety, Gary attempts to swap in right on to cover his youngest star's tail quite literally. But before he can do so, the young Oak hits upon another stroke of luck when he sees her eyes slowly flutter back open. But this is not the full extent of the luck, as when Diva continues her onslaught, the dragon's eyes glint with determination as the bright light of evolution erupts all around her. The resultant power boost then allows the now Dragonite to rise to her new created feet with a mighty roar that blows the puffball back, drowning out her music. This upstaging is something the fairy type refuses to abide, and so as soon as she writes herself in the air, she deflates and begins to rampage against the pseudo-legendary, scrappily wailing on her face with double slap. However, this move goes far beyond the five slap limit most Pokemon strive for, as this matter of pride drives the puffball to break her limits as she fights to regain the spotlight. It is here that Dragonite's docile and skittish nature rears its head, as the evolution combined with the ferocity of this attack sees her too overwhelmed to heed Gary, her only defense becoming to engage in the contest of savage slaps with the puff until Richie himself physically pulls her off of the newly evolved dragon, asking her firmly to relax and causing her to finally sigh and stomp off back to his side. Due to this loss of composure, Violet declares her, like so, totally disqualified for picking on that big sweet dragon like that, bringing Richie and his ace down to a two-on-one situation, which Diva immediately is remorseful for. Nonetheless, Richie smiles as he pats her head, exuding his cool confidence born under tutelage from men as cunning as Rocket Boss Giovanni and as courageous as Pyramid King Brandon. Returning to the field with a buzz, Dune wastes no time in blowing away the stealth rocks as they raise to strike her. Though, all the same, this action gives Gary just the opening he needs to have Dragonite bum rush the insectoid dragon with his explosive speed and force. Bathing her newly created claws in green dragonic energy, Dragonite slashes at Dune with Dragon Claw. Though, the desert dragon is faster, bringing up her whip like tail to catch the blow with a dragon tail of her own. The pair of wyverns then break apart, though their reprieve is short lived as both Richie and Gary urge them forward once more, resulting in a second clash of claws and tails. However, this time, Richie has a plan, telling Dune to whip up the fragments of the shattered stealth rocks, a command his starter is happy to obey. From its secluded corner atop the stands, the being with Ash's face cannot help but watch on with some interest. He alone knows what Richie has planned, having seen it through the memories of his component, and as a result, he alone knows the power of this move, with it even able to topple legends. As the amalgam has predicted, what follows is the Desert Dragon's roar with the stealth rocks making up the material component of the attack as Dragonite finds herself being sandblasted in the face. Like with Regirock, this is too much for the pseudo-legendary to endure, resulting in Dragonite falling forward and Gary being brought down to his last battler as well. Eyeing each other from across the battlefield, Gary and Richie confer, stating that this is it, winner take all. To this end, they make a pact. No more tricks, no more games. Just one last clash with the strongest coming out on top. With this agreed upon, Gary brings out his Rhydon, and as promised, each trainer gives a single command, Mega Horn for Rhydon and Dragon Rush for Dune. As one, the pair of Pokemon charge at each other, Horn clashing against Atenae in a showing of force none of the spectators are likely to forget. Though the collision has driven the duo to a halt, they are far from still, each pushing against each other with the pressure of their attacks causing crack to form in the ground. Soon, these cracks turn to tremors with the battlefield beginning to shake while Gary and Richie both forced to dig in their heels as not to be knocked off their feet. Violet, it seems, is not so lucky, landing on her butt and yelling that these two crazy kids need to call off this attack since all the shaking is ruining their hair. However, both Richie and Gary will not. This is the culmination of all of their training, everything they and their Pokemon have sacrificed to be here, and so come what may, they will ride this out to the bitter end. A moment later, this comes to an end as the force finally becomes too much, blowing both Dune
Rune and Rhydon back. In unison, the duo slams back into their respective arena walls behind them with cracks forming to match the ones in the floor. Then, in a similar act of mirroring, they fall forward, lying seemingly unconscious. All eyes then fall on Violet, as it is now up to her to decide what the verdict will be. And after a moment of thought, she says that she guesses whoever gets up first will be the winner, since refereeing a hold rematch sounds like a drag. With this now decided, all that's left is to wait. While down on the field, Gary and Richie each yell their encouragement to their friends to get back up, reminding them of all the things they have been through together. Being loyal companions, this causes both Pokemon to stir and push themselves onto their elbows, though where one of them finds the strength to rise to her feet, the other does not, crashing back to the ground in a light puff of dust. As a result, when Rhydon lets out a triumphant roar, she is declared the winner while Richie steps onto the field to sling an arm over Dune's wing, telling her she did great. Walking over to join his rival, Gary thanks Richie for an amazing battle, grinning that the auburn-haired boy really pushed him to his limits. Returning the smile, Richie replies that it was his pleasure, before urging Gary to go all the way. With the two boys then shaking hands and renewing their bonds of friendship and rivalry as they bring the semi-final battle to a close. In contrast, when Silver and his nameless opponent take to the field 10 minutes later, there is no joviality or indication of friendship. Instead, both battlers share matching expressions of stoic determination. In a calm voice, the boy who was once Ash Ketchum asks Silver if he is ready, but with a scowl, the redhead answers that he's ready alright, ready to beat this imposter and bring his friend back. Showing that same look of sorrow he did when Delia asked if he was Ash, the amalgam states that he would like nothing better, but he's afraid it's not so simple. Ash is gone, and this battle will not change that. Gritting his teeth, Silver retorts that he's not so sure. This whole mess began when they fought Mewtwo together in the Viridian Gym. So if one battle can change their fate so drastically, who's to say another can't do the same? Calmly, the black-haired stranger sighs that perhaps Silver is right. Though right or wrong, his plans are unchanged. He will battle Ash's old rival with all his might, and win this competition he dreamed of his whole life, since it is the best tribute he can give to what he once was. Then, he does something truly surprising grabbing five Pokeballs from his belt and holding them into the air so that Crocodile, Fira, Hitmonlee, Golduck, and Charizard all appear behind him and Meowth, thus revealing his entire party. From the sideline, Sabrina, who has agreed to referee so she can use her psychic ability to prevent another AJ incident if need be, having come to know Silver's psyche and being concerned for the young boy and clone she and Annabelle tried to help, tells the black-haired boy this is against the rules, since the League allows only one Pokemon to battle at a time. Though still calm, he replies that he is not bringing them out to battle, but watch, so that they may choose their own opponent and receive whatever closure they require, revealing that deep down in their hearts, Ash Ketchum and his Pokemon wanted a full throttle rematch with Silver too. With his mind now perplexed and heart set ablaze, Silver asks if this is some attempt from quote unquote Ash to give himself a handicap, pointing out that this will put him at a massive disadvantage. With a shake of his head, the spiky haired youth answers that his reason is exactly what he already said, no more, no less. As unlike their former sponsor, he does not deal in duplicity. He then invites Silver to choose his first Pokemon, and not wanting to hold anything back, the redhead opens up for Alligator. This in turn inspires Crocodile to step forward, with a pair of crocodilians eyeing each other coldly, as they anticipate their rematch from all the way back in Vermilion. Then when Sabrina gives the call to begin, they lunge at each other. Immediately, it becomes apparent that Silver and Feraligator have the upper hand not only in terms of typing, but synchronicity, as their obvious faith in each other built-in love and forgiveness allows them to function as a single unit, with Silver calling for quick ice punches and aqua jets, Feraligator delivering just that. In contrast, Crocodile and his trainer are far less in tune. The Desert Croc seeming to hesitate with each order he receives, as if weighing up whether to obey or not. This plays havoc on his reaction time, as these moments of appraisal are opening Silver and Feraligator can prey on, showing off the finalized form of their fighting style. Merciless like the old Silver, but not brutal as the proof of compassion he now feels for both his Pokemon and his opponents. This quickly forces Crocodile into a corner with the Jotonian starter wailing on its rival with a volley of frosty jabs and water shrouded shoulder charades, which cause him to curl up into himself to conserve energy and body heat as he normally would. Nonetheless, Ash's Revenant urges his starter to keep going, and it's only here that Silver notices something odd. The raven haired boy is verbally commanding Crocodile, an act he has not needed to perform with Ash's other Pokemon, unless, as in the battle with Misty being somewhat overperformative or expressive. But it quickly dawns on him that Crocodile is also of the dark type, as the power of foul play makes a black flame like energy burst off the Desert Croc in a savage intercepting blow, showing Crocodile's true intent to pick apart the opponent's rhythm, which even the boy wearing Ash's face seems to notice now along with the crowd. As Feraligator is driven back, the announcer sings Crocodile's praises, while Feraligator itself 
itself is forced to reckon with the vast difference in physical strength between itself and the other reptile. However, covering his back, Silver seizes on this chink in the armor, informing his partner they have the advantage since the Faker can't use his fancy telepathy for near instant commands. Growling in agreement, for Alligator returns to their opening strategy, continuing to abuse their speed advantage over the ground type as it once again uses Aqua Jet, though this is only to close the distance, as at the last second it switches to Waterfall, attempting to slam down atop the opponent and stack on further damage to Ash's first starter. However, instead of shying away from the pain, Crocodile asserts the difference in their upbringing as he is able to surge through the splashing liquids and land a critical crunch directly on For Alligator's tail, before electrifying his fangs and attempting to roll and twist as they did in their first battle. However, this time when For Alligator tries to use its fangs and claws to free itself, Crocodile finally used the last move he had yet from their last battle, it being Dig, which allows him to brutally use For Alligator as a shovel as he tunnels through the half muddy ground. In an instant, both combatants are gone with a stadium falling silent, only for the quiet to be broken by a spark of electricity, which causes a loud kaboom to rock the ground, followed by the emergence of the two muddy reptiles, though one is clearly slung over the other, unconscious that being for Alligator, with Crocodile respectfully returning it to the surface now that their duel is concluded. As Silver recalls his starter, the entity in red does likewise, saying that it deserves a break after such an intense bout. Nodding gruffly, Crocodile does as its trainer says, stomping back to join the others, while beside him Charizard huffs, seemingly annoyed with his decision. It is therefore a blank slate battlefield as Silver calls forth Honchcrow, while Meowth clambers off a new management's shoulders hissing that he has a score to settle with the hulking hunk of Fancy Feast. Like with Crocodile, the Amalgam shows this, though unlike the last fight, it is not a drawn out brawl, instead being a summary win for Meowth as he uses his sneak chop to vanish and reappear above the mafioso bird just as Silver calls for it, striking it in the back of the neck and sending it spiraling to the earth with a squawk before taking advantage with the Fury Swipes barrage. Having been on the receiving end of that move twice now, Silver can't help but wince empathetically, though all the same, he returns Honchkrow and begins contemplating who can help him recover from Ash's 2-0 lead. Ultimately, he settles on Gengar, with the Scratch Cat saying that he'll stick around to face the ghost. If that last fight was a tribute to all he learned from Firo, then this will be a swan song to his two greatest teachers, the boss and Mewtwo. Flashing his claws, the Norm type then rushes in for a Night Slash, striking Gengar for super effective damage before coming around for a technician empowered thief. Such an onslaught would be enough to fill an ordinary Pokemon, though Gengar is far from ordinary. A fact it equally demonstrates is it floats forward and swells me off in one gulp by enlarging the sides of its mouth to twice that of its body. In the immediate aftermath, no one is sure to make of this, with even the usually composed Sabrina sweat dropping as she comments that she's pretty sure fatally injuring a Pokemon is grounds for instant qualification. Though being used to Gengar in his off the wall style by now, Silver casually assures her that Meowth isn't dead, even urging his ghost to prove it. At once, Gengar sticks out his rolled out tongue, and good to Silver's word, Meowth is there, wrapped up and looking thoroughly displeased. Though the lick attack cannot deal any damage to the normal type, he still does not appreciate being lunch, telling the purple palooka to put him down. Then cackling in a way that makes Meowth wish he'd chosen his words more carefully, Gengar tosses the cat into the air before flying up after him. When the pair reach their zenith, the ghost then fires off a point blank dark pulse, which drives me off back into the ground, all the while laughing hysterically. Rising to his feet with a roar a Persian would be envious of and dusting himself off, Meowth mutters that Gengar is a wise guy, eh? Well, soon it'll be laughing on the other side of his face. Unfortunately, this threat doesn't quite garner the response Meowth might have hoped for, as thinking this sounds like a fun idea, Gengar literally migrates his face to the back of its head and begins laughing even harder. However, this foolishness comes at a cost, as with Gengar looking the other way, Meowth is able to spring up and rake it with another super effective Night Slash. He then prepares to finish the Shadow Pokemon off with another thief, only to be grabbed by Gengar's arms as the ghost brings its face back around to grin maliciously at the Scratch Cat. Gulping as Silver snarks, he pegged the cat smart enough to spot a hustle. Meowth nervously chuckles that he didn't mean nothing by that comment before, but it seems Gengar is smart enough to see through this lie. Either that, or it just likes shocking people, as without missing a beat, it channels Thunderbolt through his hands, causing Meowth to shriek and spasm in the poltergeist's grip. Try as he might, Meowth cannot get out of this dire predicament, and so it is that when Gengar drops him a few minutes later, it is what spirals in his eyes. Stepping onto the field, what was once Ash cradles the feline in his arms, his expression one of concern as he surveys Meowth. Seeing this, the Scratch Cat tells new management not to look at him like that, not the way the boss would when he was worried about him. He can't stand it, not after everything. Smiling slightly, the entity apologizes, saying he did not mean to cause Meowth distress, though he should know what he once was, truly cherished the Scratch Cat and considered him his truest partner. He then pats the feline on the head and bids him to rest. 
saying their work together is only just beginning, and when the time comes, he will need me out to stand by his side as he did with Ash. From his side of the field, Silver watches this exchange through his keen eye of a junior detective. From what he can see, there truly is no duplicity to any of this, just like the amalgam had said at the start of the battle. Though more than that, it's almost like he can see Ash's influence on this stranger, similar to how Looker said he could see Ash's effect on him the first time they met. Unfortunately, this only complicates things for Silver rather than simplifying them, though at the moment, the only thing that matters is this battle and his next move. After a moment of deliberation, Silver chooses to let Gengar rest after all the super effective hits it took in the last fight, replacing it with Magnazone. While on his opponent's side of the field, Firo takes to the air, signaling her readiness to battle. From the look in the Bird of Prey's eye, she still hasn't forgiven Magnazone for blowing up and taking her down with it back at Koga's gym, causing Silver to warn his steely friend to be careful and keep its distance as a sound barrier breaking drill run is launched center mass leaving the metal UFO warbling as it surges a massive amount of small glowing metallic spheres that explode in front of it and Firo, negating her attack as she instantly prioritizes circling back and roosting up to restore the damage from this devastating magnet bomb, as the announcer puts it. Pushing this opening, Silver then asks for a double team, aiming to paralyze Ash's flyer to slow it down to finish it off with a zap cannon. However, Firo cocks her head crudely at one of the imposter's order before seemingly agreeing and carrying them out. Drill running into to the ground to perform a repeat of what Ketchum has dubbed the Wackadiglet, allowing her to not only avoid Silver and Magnazone's counterattack, but also stack on damage from the mass of pot shots this speedy avian unleashes in a blink of an eye, once again swaying parts of the crowd due to their self-appointed villain's undeniable battle prowess. Before the tide is completely shifted from them, Magnazone lets out a loud, low warble. Silver has come to recognize it, showing remorse for displeasing its partner, as it resorts to leaning back on its old trunk card of explosion, just as Firo attempts a final drill peck enhanced drill run pass. However, this added rotation allows her to slice through the air like a high-velocity ballistic, tunneling a brand new hole in the ground just in time to escape with only a few cinch tail feathers, and rising triumphantly from it a few moments later as the dust settles and Magnazone is declared unable to battle by Sabrina. Returning the loyal tank of his team, Silver insists he is by no means disappointed in it, smirking as he makes his next decision, throwing its ball out in the clear and it's showtime, only for the bright red Pokeball to clatter to the ground, snap open, and reveal itself an empty container. While the announcer and crowd ought to be questioned and some laugh at this, Sabrina begins to warn Silver he will need to make a real selection or risk a DQ. But then, Sheen and the Amalgamation suddenly feel a chill, both recognizing the presence of ghostly energy a moment too late. As Gengar takes advantage of the confusion to travel from the shadow of its Pokeball interior into Firo's shadow as she passes overhead, allowing a preemptive use of Astonish to get in close. Though the ghost-type technique doesn't affect Firo, the fright certainly does, and what's far more scary is Silver's timing the Amalgam's telepathic order to fly with his own instruction for Gengar to end things quick with a point-blank ice beam. Cackling mischievously, the Mad Phantom's hands glow with frigid energy, which it releases in a powerful shove back towards the ground treating Firo to a taste of her own medicine, as the critical hit is able to finish the job Magnazone began. Once again, the clone's imposter seems stunned, a bead of sweat forming on his forehead, as he catches onto the game of Meowth and Pikachu they've begun to play, wondering if it's the bits of Silver's DNA that made up Mewtwo as well which are allowing him to adapt so quickly, or if it is just this young man's lineage. The idea of cunning that surpasses even that of the former Rocket crime boss making him uneasy. However, these are questions the Amalgam's next Pokemon couldn't care less about, that being Charizard, as he steps forward to battle. With the element of surprise gone, Silver and Gengar have to be more direct, keeping their grip on the tempo of this battle with a volley of interchanging sludge bombs and shadow balls. The vastly different speeds the goopy gunk and ethereal orbs fly quickly leave very little to the battlefield outside of Silver's control. However, Charizard pridefully answers this as he would far before training with Mewtwo, deflecting everything thrown at him with raw power in the form of overheat rather than flamethrower, which quickly sees the pseudo Drake literally burn through all of its non physical stamina, but in turn set the battlefield ablaze, the landscape quickly burning and scorching into a hellscape, while the bright light detours any more evasion from Gengar. Calling this bluff, Silver has his ghost type port strength into a full power shadow ball, the subsequent orb towering over Gengar in size as it barrels down on Charizard who refuses to dodge specifically because the imposter wearing Ash's face is begging him to in his head. Instead, he relies on his physical strength while breathing in the flames around him to charge straight through the 
Shadow Ball and burst out the other side as the flames increase in temperature and burn a bright blue that mesmerizes Gengar before it is slammed into with the force of a meteor. This is Charizard's declaration of dominance with him roaring fiercely even as the recoil's bioelectricity pesters him. Despite the lead this gives his opponent, Silver remains cool reminding himself that this battle means much more than a petty competition to him. This is about truth and the only way he has left to find it. All out battle. In the stands, Lance can be seen reluctantly engrossed in the battle, fists clenched tightly and eyes glued as he finds himself rooting for Silver despite his dislike of the son of Giovanni. Beside him, Pierce struggles to keep a genuine grin off of his face and instead settles for a familiar confident sneer, intrigued by the limits of his little brother's power. It's Silver's matchup appears, it is welcome with familiar applause, as the citizens of Kanto have been made almost as amicable to the intimidating fighting type as they have been to the Dragonite line, thanks to Lance's right hand man and most frequent challenger Bruno. As a result, when the full armed monster and pseudo dragon clash, it is to the sound of cheers. In the midst of the clash, Charizard has been forced to resort to a volley of its punching moves and wing attack, rather than another massive and taxing flare blitz, with this strategy at first presenting a competent counter to Matcham's advantage in limbs. However, the combination of Ash and Mewtwo recognizes Charizard's folly before it does, snapping out of its daze just in time to call for him to disengage as Matchamp ends fanning engagement in the Slugfest, suddenly glowing in the dense fighting type energy of revenge and knocking Charizard wildly into the air with a twin set of hammer fists. Up in the air, the Fire Drake rights itself just in time to gain more altitude as Silver relentlessly follows up with a strong version of Stone Edge, creating large pillars of jagged rock rather than smaller stones to be fired off. And as it does, Matcham leaps to all six, darkly pursuing Charizard into the air on its own Stone Edge as he finally heeds Ash's call for an emergency flare blitz. Agreeing to charge back and meet Matcham as it leaps from its crumbling stone tower and takes the full brunt of the flaming dive only to ultimately grit its teeth through the pain and lock all four arms around the dragon, thus giving it a grip on its wings that allows it to clumsily manipulate their flight a tad, aiding in creating a ton of centrifugal force to reverse the attack with a seismic toss. This sends the pair of Pokemon hurtling into the still near molten arena floor, slamming into it with a massive dust cloud rising in their wake, and when it fades, it is to reveal Machamp, a bit singed and scorched, but otherwise more than willing to continue taking back the lead in this battle. The same cannot be said for Charizard with it still defiantly trying to rise back to its feet with an obviously sprained wing, being returned with a scowl towards his trainer. Silver gets the feeling the amalgam is speaking with Golduck even before the waterfowl hazily quacks and steps onto the battlefield. Recognizing he is down to his last fresh Pokemon, Silver agrees to keep his superpower Mon in the match, at least for a while longer, quickly forming a strategy to deal with the Wacky Duck's long range attack power, as the boy wearing Ash's face tries to steal his momentum back with an immediate telepathic order for Hydro Pump. Even with his hulking frame, Matchamp is able to evade this, with his trainer noting how slow and wide spanning the beam of liquid is. Just as Golduck ends the torrent and instead surges Blue Fridge's energy from his beak, the ice beam bolting out far faster and leaving with a now wet floor flash frosted over as Machamp is forced to take to the air again in a super long jump. This is an opportunity the aquatic mage is quick to capitalize on, as by using sonic power, he is able to buff his speed and reaction time allowing a subsequent hyper beam to land true on the airborne Machamp, driving it painfully back into the arena wall. However, naturally resisting it, this is not the end for Machamp, and as Golduck is forced to recharge from the intensity of the normal type attack, Machamp once again shows its tenacity born from its time as Silver's sadistic enforcer. However, now it stands before the crowd as their hero, answering their cheers and considering the daunting distance between itself and the aquatic long range specialist. However, continuing to fight like Ash, Silver goes for broke with a new strategy, telling Machamp to close the distance as fast as he can while clapping with Thunder Punch. Showing the trust born from carrying his admittedly frail but still dangerously cunning trainer, Machamp heeds the order without hesitation, putting all it has into powerful strides while sweating from the efforts of manifesting the elemental punches on all four of his hands while unclasping its fists and clapping them as he lunges forward. Visible pressure waves laced with arcs of lightning surge towards Ash and Gold Duck's side of the field, afflicting the cocky waterfowl with one of its old splitting headaches as it is brought to its knees from the sound, blown back by the pressure and shocked by the electric nature of these phenomenon all at once. This technique is so effective that even Ash's imposter is stunned briefly due to being made up of partially a Pokemon itself, and a psychic type at that with all of the sensitivity to disruptive stimuli that entails. As such, for the briefest of moments, those not forced to clutch their ears and cringe from a champ's noisy 
charge once again feel their hearts gripped by fear as the figure taking up Ash Ketchum's trainer box begins to flicker and warp unnaturally. Then suddenly a buzzing fills the minds of the onlookers, forcing them to avoid their gaze. With Golda taking the opportunity to meet Machamp's charge with an explosive outpouring of its full psychic power. Meanwhile, Machamp valiantly attempts to persist against the expanding force with its electrified palms, doing all it can to match its physical might to Golduck's mental strength until another blast consumes the battlefield with dust and debris as the two powerhouses clash. Once again, the arena's fans are needed to clear away the haze, and as they do, it is revealed to be a double knockout born from the two Pokemon's pride, which sees them both returned with encouragement from their trainers. By now, it seems the Fuse entity has found its own temple capable of keeping up with Silver's battle style, which resembles both Giovanni's cold and precise analytical style, and Ash's flexible and ever-evolving freeform style. And so, it is that Silver reveals his final team member to be his Eevee. It is clear which of the two inspirations he has chosen to draw from. Sabrina in particular finds this curious as she gifted him an Abra after their battle, which would have given him the clear advantage over his opponent's final Pokemon, Hitmonlee. Though, she supposes if this is some last ditch effort to appeal to the person his rival used to be, far be it from her to stand in his way. And so, as Sabrina announces the final match, Silver goes on the attack, but in a vastly different way than one would expect, calling for baby doll eyes just as Hitmonlee takes on the stance to begin its high velocity jumping style. This causes the kicking fiend to cringe for a moment, though it quickly passes, with Hitmonlee using its legs to pump its blood faster and begin speeding up. This in turn forces Eevee to use a familiar position of needing to dodge the still powerful attacks of her opponent, though thanks to living and training with Gengar, this has become a specialty of hers with Quick Attack, proving vital in allowing her to weave and zip around in a manner that outpaces Ash's springy martial artist. As she flees, Eevee begins using her charm, though the slight reduction in speed needed to launch this attack is enough to tip Hitmonlee off to Eevee's point of landing, meaning that she is met with a mega axe kick just as her feet touch the ground, with the critical blow negating any attempts to lower the fighter's attack as Eevee's body forms a small crater. However, the light shining from Hitmonlee's foot as it tries to stomp down on Eevee's head is made to look pitiful a moment later by the brilliant gleam that bursts from Eevee herself when Silver passionately calls that he knows she can hold strong and that he believes in her. This earns the redhead a happy yip as Hitmonlee suddenly finds the pair of long floppy ears he had been standing on replaced by ribbon-like tendrils which quickly ensnare his springy leg. Then to make matters worse, these pastel colored feelers begin slamming him around quite brutally for a newly revealed fairy type. As Sylveon makes it clear that even in her changed form, she is still the Pokemon of Silver. Struggling to free himself now, Hitmonlee attempts to stretch his coiled legs to slip through the ribbon's hold, though this only makes the force of each slam more painful as the Kicking Fiend is unable to brace through his legs now. As a result, he remains the fairy's prisoner until he is finally flung loose and sent sailing across the battlefield and into a wall, much like Machamp had been, which along with the mid-league Evo makes the crowd go wild. Even so, Hitmonlee hangs tough, using this to fuel a new jumping frenzy much faster and harder to track than the one Misty had to deal with. The boy wearing Ash's face then calls Silver, admitting that right now the bit of Ash catch him still inside him is screaming with pure joy, stating his pride in Silver's growth and that there is only one way the boy would have liked this battle to end, which he thinks Silver already knows. At these words, the redhead feels his hand move to the discarded hat on his belt as a small smirk curls his lip. Yes, the newcomer is right, though this is not the only truth he has come to realize, as he now knows that this case won't be closed whether he wins or loses this battle, and in a way, that becomes a relief. Sensing this in Silver's aura, Sylveon smiles, yips, and cheers around. The feeling of a burden being lifted from her trainer's shoulders giving a much needed second wind as both trainers verbally call for double edge. From Ash's side of the field, the Hitmonlee jumping around suddenly explodes with another shockwave as he flies towards Silver's, the ground itself being torn up by the force of Hitmonlee's reckless charging slide kick variant of the move. Meanwhile, Sylveon rushes in to meet this, her brand new pixelate ability converting the normal energy of her own charge into more mystical fairy energy, the strength and nature of which quickly proves effective at pushing back against the faster and much physically stronger fighting type. Due to the force of their attacks, the pair of Pokemon do not actually make contact, instead simply struggle against the dense energy coat of the other until finally Hitmonlee's flying kick surges forward, passing through his own energy and forcing its way into Sylveon's, ultimately knocking her back and sending the two combatants skidding to a halt. In the aftermath of the resultant shockwave, there is a silent pause, then when Sylveon fails to get back up, Sabrina declares Ash Ketchum the winner and second finalist, officially bringing the penultimate day of the Indigo League tournament to a close.
Back at the Pokemon Center, the group of Delia, Professor Oak, Brock, Misty, Silver, Richie, and Gary converge with the move being an odd one as they must commiserate the losses of Richie and Silver while also celebrating Gary's advancement to the finals. Thankfully, Gary is in no mood for anything ostentatious, instead suggesting they get a dinner and then maybe some light sparring since he wants to make sure his Pokemon are in top shape for tomorrow's match. Something in the way he says this conveys a nervousness the group has never seen from the self-assured Oak Boy before. Though both, truthfully, neither Misty nor Silver can blame him having battled the entity with Ash's face for themselves. While they are convinced he is not evil, he is still powerful and as driven as both Ash and Mewtwo combined, meaning that unless Gary keeps his guard up, he runs the very real risk of being swept away as the one standing between the amalgam and his mercurial goal. Out of respect for their friendship, Silver goes to share this insight with Gary, though before he can, he feels himself being tapped on the shoulder by Nurse Joy's Chansey. Looking at the pink Pokemon, the redhead sees that it clearly wants him to follow it, so he excuses himself, wandering after the creature as it leads him upstairs into a vacant guest room. It is only here that Chansey reveals reveals that it is not in fact Chansey, but instead another of Looker's brilliant disguises as he greets his young protege with a smile, congratulating him on his top 4 finish and laying a hand on his shoulder in a gesture that has become comfortably familiar. Thanking his mentor, Silver asks what the man is doing here, with a detective grinning that he wasn't about to miss Silver's match, though having learned a lot from Looker since forming their partnership, the son of Giovanni replies that if he simply wanted to give his congratulations, he could have done so publicly, meaning there must be a secondary motive caught between pride and sheepishness. Looker admits that his student is absolutely correct in that deduction, saying that he's actually brought him here at the request of Lance. At once, Silver's hackles raise, though in a calming voice, Looker asks his protege to trust him, saying that Lance simply requested that all Interpol agents currently at the Indigo Plateau attend a special meeting, since he has something big planned that he needs their help with. At these words, the cape-clad champion comes swanning into the room, Erica at his side, and it is clear from the look on his face that though he is barracking for him in his battle, that does not mean his esteem for the boy has raised any. When the four of them are assembled, Lance wastes no time in laying out what he has called them here for, an operation of great importance which he begrudgingly admits he cannot carry out alone. Listening intently, Silver cannot help but feel his frown deepening with each word, until he finally snaps that what Lance has planned is reckless, and could result in countless people getting hurt if it goes wrong. Not to mention, it's underhanded and cowardly, with the boy scoundrelly reminding the group that they are the International Police, not Team Rocket. Eyes flashing, Lance coldly corrects that he, Looker, and Erica are the International Police. Silver is just their hunting growlith, and it is not his place to question orders. Instead, his job is to do as he's told and attack whatever they point him in the direction of. Equally cold, Silver snarls that he could ruin this little scheme. All he'd have to do is walk out of that door and start telling everyone what Lance plans to do, though here it is Erica who stops him, keeping a tone of train neutrality, and she admits that while he could, revealing this plan could very well have the result he seeks to avoid, as their quarry might feel cornered and act rashly. So like it or not, he has to go along with this for the greater good. Looking into her eyes, Silver finally thinks he understands why the gym leaders remained by Lance's side, even after the evidence gives him the events of New Island caused between them. And so in a voice that is more statement than question, he comments that she doesn't like this plan either, does she? Now it is Looker's turn to speak, as in an honest tone that conveys the deep trust he has in Silver. He answers that none of them like it, but sometimes their job means making the icky calls for the sake of justice, a fact he knows Silver is aware of. The only question that remains now is whether his newest protege is prepared to do what has to be done and show the world which side of the law he has chosen to stand on. The next morning dawns, bright and early, with Gary once more finding himself on the battlefield of the Indigo Stadium. Across from him is the person who was once known as Ash, while to his side, Lance watches him approach, having volunteered to be the special guest referee. When Gary and Lance's eyes meet, the Dragon Master gives his ex-apprentice the perfect stage smile of his, wishing him luck and in a tone befitting of a proud teacher saying that though he would have delighted if Gary would be the one to challenge him in the Champions League, he hopes the boy knows that he won't be playing favorites in this match. This statement tells Gary two very important things. First, the field is might, meaning anything said down here will be projected to the audience. And second, that in spite of how much Lance despises him, he has reasons to hate Ash even more. While this could just be because of the AJ incident, Gary has his doubts, not putting it past the champion to have figured out what the entity truly is, which poses the pressing question of what he intends to do about it. This, unfortunately, Gary cannot tell, as why he can summarize it's not good, he can't afford to let Lance get in his head, since he has a battle to focus on. To this end, when Lance gives the call to 
begin, bidding both young trainers to battle with honor, Gary decides to go big right out of the gate, bringing forth Blastoise. Despite having the privilege of choosing second, his black-haired opponent surprisingly responds with Charizard, or perhaps not so surprisingly, as this is such an ash move that for a moment Gary thinks he understands what Silver and Misty meant when they told him they could see bits of Ash's heart and personality peeking through the amalgam stony veneer. All the same, he does not hold back, bringing the attack to Ash with the Hydro Pump, which Charizard meets with an overheat, dissipating both attacks and blanketing the field in steam. Looking to capitalize on this, Gary has Blastoise charge into the steam and take Charizard's unawareness with a Skull Bash, though it seems his rival had the same idea as Charizard suddenly bursts out of the haze, having wordlessly been commanded to close in and use Thunder Punch. Fist and Skull collide with ringing force. They're refusing to lose ground. Both starter Pokemon turn their recoil into momentum. Coming back for another immediate second pass, as Charizard once more attempts Thunder Punch, while Blastoise switches back to Hydro Pump. Unfortunately, neither combatant is able to pull out a win here, as the collision instead becomes an explosion, which sends both Charizard and Blastoise rocketing back to land in front of their trainers, while the updraft of their impact clears away the steam, making the battlefield visible once more. Though the match has been going on for less than a full minute, the pair of Pokemon both show signs of exertion for this heated clash. But when their trainers ask if they wish to return, their response is the same, a defiant resounding no. Resuming their clash, Blastoise once again goes for Hydro Pump, figuring that if he can exploit Charizard's critical water weakness, he can ground the lizard and clinch the match. However, this is an outcome the stubborn Pseudo Dragon will not abide, using Acrobags to dodge the torrents before switching into Flare Blitz. Thanks to the increased duration of his body from all the maneuvers he pulled with Acrobatics, the resultant flames burn both larger and hotter than normal, becoming an Inferno as he slams into Blastoise and even managing to evaporate most of the water so that both combatants are hit with neutral damage despite their typings. Now up close once again, Blastoise uses Rapid Spin, grinding his diamond hard shell into Charizard's stomach while with a pained roar, the fiery lizard begins hammering at it with his fists. At first, this takes the form of Thunder Punches, though when these do negligible damage, he switches to Mega Punch, with it only taking a single superpowered hit to bring an end to the rotation. Springing back to his feet, Blastoise reverts to his old faithful, and on Gary's command, launches a third Hydro Pump, this time at point blank range. Still silent, the Spectre of Ash telepathically permissions Charizard to do whatever he feels necessary, be it fight the flood or flee from it, and being who he is, there is only one choice fight. Gathering different power in each hand, Charizard starts by swinging a Mega Punch directly into the Hydro Pump, splashing it away but not creating the denotion from their first clash. While this does result in stinging water bathing Charizard, it also gives him the space he needs to swing his other fist, the one coated in crackling electricity, with it finding its mark in Blastoise's jaw and sending him crashing backwards. Breathing heavily now, steam begins to rise off Charizard as a faint red-heated aura surrounds the Pseudo Dragon, burning away the remnants of the Hydro Pump. Recognize this as Blaze, Gary can't help but feel a little worried, until he sees that an undiluting blue watery aura has also taken shape around Blastoise, Torrent. Looking his rival in the eye, Gary comments that this is it, isn't it? To which the amalgam merely nods. Then, as they give one final command, Hydro Pump for Blastoise and Overheat for Charizard. Letting out matching roars, the two Kanto starters then let loose their final attacks, with the ball hitting the beam in the center of the battlefield. Up above, the crowds cheer, with some urging Lance's protege to vanquish the villain, while others cry for their favorite anti hero to defy the odds once again. However, it seems neither side will get their wish, as when the beam struggle ends in an explosion of dense steam, both Charizard and Blastoise are swept off their feet and sent slamming back into the walls, rendering them unconscious and ending the first match of the finals in a draw. The combatants of the next battle have already been selected in both competitors' hearts long before the league begun, so before Lance can get over the first clash that genuinely kindled his fighting spirit, Crocodile and Rhydon both flood onto the field. The rival ground types are then both ordered to unleash an earthquake with all of they have, resulting in both ends of the battlefield trembling as a seismic energy creates spiderweb cracks in the ground. Though in spite of this, both masters of the earth choose to take the full brunt of their opponent's attacks without flinching, using this as a means to both size up the other and prove their own fortitude. However, it seems that not all ground types are made equal, as while Crocodile was neutral damage, it is clear that Rhydon is actively inconvenienced by the masses of shaking. Though this is not the only difference, as the key disparity lies in the way that they have been raised, since while Ash Ketchum focused on honing and controlling his Sandile's destructive power, leading to his attack and speed being his greatest strengths, Gary Oak raised the 
Giovanni Dassau Rhyhorn to take advantage of her sheer size and bulk in order to help Squirrel develop its own tankiness, meaning endurance and defense are her strong suits. As a result, this yet again is a battle of complete opposites. With the ground as a domain, they both rule being the area in which they will each stake their claim to supremacy. Meanwhile, their seemingly equally antithetical trainers are ready for the next attack, with the anti-hero of the league ordering his dark tyrant to rush in. Using the slight advantage he has gained for a full power revenge. Lunging out low to the ground, the croc moves swiftly, his heavy frame leaving a respectable sand trail in his wake as he ferociously attacks with a volley of swipes, jabs, and other ruthless blows that Gary tells his second star to block and endure while using rock polish. This is followed by a high-speed hammer arm, far faster than anything right on side should be able to produce, and strong enough that it sends the desert croc tumbling end over end, for a moment looking dazed from the super effective blow. However, being made of sturdier stuff than most, Crocodile manages to shake it off at the imposter's vocal encouragement, citing how he knows personally how tough the dark type is. This allows Crocodile to bolster his spirits again, remembering who it is and what his journey has meant, as he ventures into the ground with Dig upon recovery. Capitalizing on this seeming blunder, Gary calls for a string of earthquakes, which Rhydon is more than happy to dole out, pounding the ground with stomps and even slamming onto all fours to ensure the roaming does her fellow rocket sponsored Mon in. As this happens and the stadium nearly shakes around him, the entity simply stares intently at the whole crocodile dub, his inability to check on it telepathically adding an air of genuine suspense as he wonders if this gamble can actually be pulled off. The wait is agonizing, with Lance anxiously jumping the gun and almost ordering Ketchum to return his defeated starter and bring out his next Pokemon, a risk of very long over two disqualification. Thankfully, the announcer chooses that moment to build suspense, claiming that Gary Oak's heavenly drill may have been the spear needed to vanquish Ash's dark tyrant, with this causing the champ to hold his tongue and allow a fellow showman his due. In that moment, Ash Ketchum's first Pokemon makes his return, until he is able to burst from the ground, coated in both the aggressive aura of revenge and the sinister black flames of foul play, erupting from the ground as cruelly and violently as his namesake, and even carrying Rhydon's massive frame into the air with it. The force of this impact clearly devastates both ground types. However, as Gary calls for another hammer arm to end things, the imposter orders Crocodile to do likewise, with another use of foul play, with the ground and dark type doing so by snagging the attacking arm with his tail, thus allowing him to throw Rhydon, which sends her hurtling back to the ground right before he follows after, using her body as a battering ram to deepen the crater she has just created. Therefore, it is not a surprise to anyone when the croc is the last one standing, now faintly surging with the erratic power-up from a moxie boost and marking himself as a very dangerous threat that Gary needs to answer, one full third of his team being weak to ground types, and Ash's ace already packing the punch without any buffs, Gary has to make his own gamble, calling upon his Pidgeot and his Mastery of the Sky to see him through here quickly putting him through his paces, as the duo begin with a multitude of agilities to maximize their speed. As a result, the crown bird of Kanto quickly becomes a blur too fast for even Crocodile's swiftest stone edges to hit, no matter how hard they are fired, thus forcing the boy calling himself Ash to make a swap and sacrifice his boost. In the starter's place comes Fira, who wastes no time in locking on to the quick-moving rival bird, noting it is a little more than a young cocky upstart, and without need of command from the amalgam. Mira moves the multi-agility technique with far more experience and precision that shocks Gary, whom recognizes this must be Ash's true fear he'd not gotten to face all the way back in Freddy's Forest. In his box, the announcer dubs the duo Gary's High Soaring Blade and Ash's Supersonic Sniper, his voice filled with admiration for both, as up above, the pair begin preparations to clash. Then as one, they swoop in at each other, with Pidgeot using aerial ace, while Firo employs the custom drill ace technique Ash practiced so hard with his first capture, also remembering a determination carry Firo through the maneuver. And as the pair pass each other, Pidgeot definitely looks to be on the receiving end of the damage, squawking in pain while Firo merely brushes off her minor injuries. This process repeats itself several more times, with Gary quickly surmising the gap of experience between the two birds. But thankfully, he has an out, using a fairly ineffective U-turn to chip off a party shot and swap into electric up with Ness. As the electric only emerges, Gary admits with a bit of sweat that the faker is certainly falling through in his pledge to push all of them, though this is not an admission of defeat, far from it, as through their duel, Gary has recognized that he and his team need to evolve once again like they did against Richie if they want to beat this guy, something he has every confidence they will be able to do. However, it seems the one who will push them to these new heights is in fact not Firo, as upon seeing Electabuzz, Ash's Spectre recalls the bird in favor for Crocodile, causing the croc to return to the field with a look of malice in his eyes. Thank Hopefully this is all it has, as his moxie boost is long gone, meaning that this will be a fair fight, or at least as fair of a fight as two Pokemon can have when one is immune to the other on a tight basis. Once, he would have believed this alone would be the deciding factor of a battle, with quantifiable data such as type 
matchups trumping all. In those days, he also would have scorned the boy standing across from him, and perhaps even his present self, having always arrogantly looked down on those who had to use hard work as a replacement for their lack of natural talent. He had been a fool back then, but now he is wiser, so ignoring the data, he instead places his faith in his strategy and his Pokemon, telling Electabuzz that it's staying in, and more importantly, it's time that they go on the attack. Heeding its trainer's words, Electabuzz rushes in, its fists crackling with electricity as it swings wildly at the Desert Croc. Though the shock does not affect him, he is still not immune to the feel of knuckles pounding his flesh, and so wanting to get rid of this annoyance, he swings his tail to swat away Yoni. However, here Crocodile is met with an impediment as Electabuzz hastily brings up a reflect, catching the swipe and halving the damage. Where this is not bad enough, the Electrotype then begins building a protective dome around itself, layering reflects and light screens on top of each other to create an impenetrable shield, or rather, an almost impenetrable shield. As with the crafty mind of a dark type, Crocodile quickly recognizes that Electabuzz cannot build a shield underneath its own feet, meaning that currently it is vulnerable to burrowing, a skill he is to be especially adept at. Diving into the dirt, Crocodile then begins to dig, though as he does, a smile quickly begins to form over Gary's face. In an instant, the entity recognizes that this is a trap his opponent had planned from the start, though due to its dark typing, what was once Ash cannot warn Crocodile of this, meaning he has no choice but to stand by and watch Electabuzz begin repeatedly striking the battlefield with ice punches. This has the effect of rapidly cooling the ground, which in turn chills Crocodile, who both trainers recall from the SSN tournament does not do well with cold. However, this is not the only benefit of Gary, as he also remembers that the cold makes Crocodile slower, meaning that when he sees the rumbling beneath Electabuzz's feet, he has plenty of time to tell it to leap in the air. Understandably, Crocodile takes this for a retreat, though in fact, nothing could be farther from the truth, as Gary having the electric Pokemon instead come back down with a cross chop, which sees it diving headfirst at the Desert Croc, who is too slow to avoid it in its chilly state. As a result, when the dust of the collision settles, it is with Ash Ketchum's starter slumped over, unconscious, half out of its hole, while Electabuzz stands over it. Unfortunately, this plan, while successful, has come at a cost, as the rapid succession of building, punching, and jumping has significantly whittled away at Electabuzz's stamina. And so subsequently, when Meowth is sent out onto the field, it only takes a single fake out for him to drop the own, before Gary can even contemplate and call it. Weighing his options, Gary decides to return Pidgeot to the field, with the imposter in turn swapping Meowth out for Vera once again. While Gary knows he probably shouldn't engage in this fight, he is also aware that if he keeps withdrawing Pidgeot, Ash could easily just do the same with Vera, placing them in an endless loop with no resolution. Better to simply face the challenge head on, since if this Pidgeot can defeat Fearow, then he will have a distinct advantage, as none of Ash's other Pokemon can fly now. In order to achieve this goal, Gary knows that he needs to be the one to strike first and strike hardest, and so holding nothing back, he has Pidgeot open the second round of this duel with Giga Impact. At once, a purple aura lined with orange spines engulfs Pidgeot as he flies at his foe. Though being a canny creature, Fero is able to dodge, using the unerring nature of Arrow Ace to aim at a point on the ground and take off its beats Pidgeot cannot match. While this does mean scraping her belly against the arena floor, Fira wisely knows this is far better than what would have happened had she let Giga Impact strike her, while also providing the added benefit of Pidgeot now being exposed, as it needs a moment to recharge. Capitalizing on this, the Amalgam has his flyer give Gary's another taste of Drill Ace, with this not being a glancing blow as the two Pokemon pass each other, but instead a head-on critical hit, which drives itself into the plumage of Pidgeot's back and sends it tumbling into the ground with a pain trip. Unfortunately, this is not the worst of it. As while Pidgeot is falling, Fearow decides to demonstrate her own Giga Impact, allowing much fiercer aura to bathe her she follows her foe down. From his box, the Amalgam cannot help but watch this turn of events with fascination. He did not order this, with the decision being entirely Fearow's own. Born of a wrathful streak that had not shown itself since the very first day Ash had met her as the leader of her own Spearow flock. Briefly, Entity wonders if this is her grief over Ash manifesting itself, though now is hardly the time for such thoughts. As back on the field, Fero spears Pidgeot in her beak and slams it into the battlefield with a sickening thud, and arguably earning the moniker Sniper, as she did not miss her prey twice. In the face of such an onslaught, Pidgeot is clearly unable to battle, though in truth, Fero doesn't look to be doing much better, as now she not only needs to recharge, but the impact of striking the ground beak first has taken a toll on her spindly body. Meanwhile, Gary is left with a choice to make, as now his rem the remaining two Pokemon are at the very disadvantage he wished to impose on Ash. Fortunately, he is not out of options, as his final pair are among his most reliable companions, and he knows just which one of them he will be able to count on to get him out of this jam.
jam. Pulling Arcanine's ball out from his belt, he brings her forth with a cry of her name, and as she lands on all fours, she lets out a prideful roar that is meant to announce her supremacy to Firo and all of those who are watching. However, it seems that Firo couldn't care less, her grief and wrath barring all thoughts of worry from her mind, so that the moment she is able, she goes in for an aerial ace. Fierce as ever, Arcanine does not run from this, instead running directly towards the swooping bird, her body of flame as she meets the flying type move with a flame charge of her own. Unlike the aerial ace clash between itself and Pidgeot, this time Firo does not come out unscathed, receiving a jolt to the system and several singed feathers which make her call indignantly. However, while Firo is expressing her anger, Arcanine is getting on with her next attack, using Thunderfang to lock her vice like jaw around Firo's long neck while they remain in close proximity. This grounds the maternal avian, taking her out of her element, literally as a matter of fact, and forcing her to fight her foe from within a headlock. Though this is not just any headlock, as thanks to the thunderous quality of the attack, bolts of electricity are racing throughout her nervous system, inhibiting her brain and causing her muscles to spasm. This makes any hopes of a counterattack all but impossible as Firo's own body is betraying her, meaning that it hardly comes as a shock when a little while later her wings stop flapping and fall to the ground, with her head doing likewise, signifying that this bout is over. Despite this win, Yuri knows he still has a long way to catch up to Ash, while he only has Arcanine his last Pokemon left. While Ash has Meowth, who has barely battled, along with a pair of fresh Pokemon who Gary will have to contend with. The Amalgam's next Pokemon is from among this latter category, as he calls out his Golden to counter Gary's fire type. And though this is a sensible choice on paper, in order to harm Arcanine, Golduck must first catch it, a feat that seems to be beyond the foul, as Gary has her use her blistering speed to stay one step ahead of the Hydro Punk Golduck sends her way. This gives Arcanine something of an advantage, and so knowing that a battle cannot be won purely by defense, Gary has his Koma Inu start employing hit and run tactics. As a student and teacher in the Psychic Arts, Golduck and the Amalgam have the best synchronicity when it comes to telepathic communication, though even they are not able to relay strategy fast enough to match the speed of Gary's hunt, with Golduck taking several pain for blows courtesy of Outrage and Play Rough. The only move Arcanine cannot seem to land is Thunderfang, as having seen his trainer's memories of what happened to Firo, Golduck is unwilling to allow those fangs to close around his neck, acting autonomously and doing whatever he has to in order to avoid them whenever Gary calls for this attack. Recognizing this fear, Gary changes tack, attempting to sow discord between the Azure Avian and his trainer by beginning a full frontal assault of Thuzuli Thunderfangs. Unfortunately, this is something of an overreach, as now that Arcanine is charging directly at Golduck, he is able to strike her with the very Hydro Pump Gary had been trying to make her avoid, having sincerely hoped he'd ran out the uses of the high power point move. Learning from this mistake, Gary returns to the old hit and run strategy that was working so well for him before, though to his dismay, it seems that he cannot step in the same river twice. As now that Golduck has tasted the first hint of victory, he is unwilling to give it up. To this end, he begins to make greater use of his psychic abilities by tossing fractured pieces of battlefield from Pidgeot's crater at Arcanine, as well as releasing psionic bursts that briefly leave the dying dog of Grimly, Gary realizes this is building to something far worse, that it is only a matter of time before either Golduck or his trainer think to freeze Arcanine in place, and then assail her with Hydro Pumps while she is helpless. To avoid this, Gary knows he has to take out the duck right now, which means relying on a risky all or nothing gamut, which may very well make a break in his prospects. Victory. Looking his honey in the eyes, he quickly asks if she's ready, and when the canine makes a soft rumble of ascent, he tells her to use Wild Charge. At once, crackling the electricity begins to surround Arcanine with the cloak, and as she runs at Golduck once more, both the duck Pokemon and his teacher smile. Gary clearly hasn't learned that repeated tricks will work on them, and so with confidence in his psychic transmission, the Amalgam orders Golduck to blast Arcanine with Hydro Pump, like he did when she attempted the Thunder Fang Barrage. Dutifully obeying, Golduck then unleashes a torrent of water upon the fire type, though to his shock, most of the attack's power is dissipated by the electric cloak, allowing Arcanine to split the stream and barrel directly into Golduck, resulting in an explosion that kicks up yet another cloud of dust. Wordlessly, the pair of trainers watch on, then, as the dust settles, they both see Golduck and Arcanine draped across each other in mutual defeat, recalling their vanquished Pokemon just as they did after their first clash of the battle. Gary and the Spectre of Ash each bring forth their next, and for Gary, last Pokemon. For Ash, it is Meowth, with the Scratch Cat descending from his favorite perch to leap onto the field, while Gary goes with his Umbreon, this causing the crowd to begin murmuring, as they had been certain that Gary would have chosen Dragonite. Though Meowth sardonically tells them not to make such a fuss on his account, as he's just here to battle for his trainer like any other Pokemon, it now becoming very clear he's enjoying the attention of the crowd. In contrast, Umbreon remains stoic in his outlook, its ominous red eyes never wavering from Meowth, and on Gary's command, it kicks the battle off with a Dark Pulse. Rings of Umbreon energy then fly at Meowth, though being quick on its feet, the normal type is able to avoid these, growling that if it's a battle for the title of Top Cat that Umbreon wants, he'd be happy to oblige, though it'll soon find he ain't giving up that mantle anytime soon. Just ask Giovanni's Persian. 
He then begins his own counteroffensive, popping his claws and lunging at the Moonlight Pokemon. Though here, Umbreon proves itself to be no slouch, retreating and firing off a Confuse Ray, which Meowth has to work hard to avoid. Next up, Umbreon tries a Baby Doll Eyes, with Meowth briefly falling victim to the charm of his fellow feline, until a sharp psychic burst from Ash's Revenant snaps him out of it. Shooting Umbreon a scowl, Meowth then orders that it stop stalling, though it seems that this is all the Dark-type wishes to do as it tries for another Confuse Ray. Dodging this one like the first, First, Meowth quickly comes to realize that a frontal assault isn't the way to beat this opponent. Luckily, when it comes to wiliness, nobody can top this scratch cat, with him falling back for now as he launches a volley of air slashes from afar. While this is a good trick in theory, it is not one Umbreon cannot overcome, as Gary tells it to use another Dark Pulse, with the beam striking the gusty blades and dissipating them one by one before striking Meowth on the head. Letting out a yowl of pain and annoyance, the normal type is blown back, though like all Meowth, it lands on its feet, riding his himself and calling this a tickle compared to some of the other Pokemon he's fought. Taking this as a challenge, Gary instructs Umbreon to keep peppering their opponent with dark pulses until they feel it, something the evolution is more than happy to do, firing off another blast of dark type energy rings. Seeing a way to use this to his advantage, Meowth continues to dodge these, capering and joking each time he does. While this may make him look like a fool, that comes with its own benefit, as nobody ever considers the Joker a threat. Though, as Umbreon is about to learn, in this game, Jokers are wild. Continuing with his apparent tomfoolery, Meowth begins to slowly close the distance between himself and Umbreon with each leap and tumble, until before the dark type and its trainer knows it, he is right on top of it, his claws extended as he gives it a taste of his technician enhanced fury swipes. At this range, there is nothing Gary or Umbreon can do but endure the claw barrage, so that when Meowth finally lets up, the evolution's best course of action is to limp back towards its trainer looking rather pitiful. Seeing an opening to end things, Meowth then goes in for a finishing blow, though all too late he realizes this is a ruse just like his own, with Umbreon finally managing to hit with a confuse rate on its third attempt. As a result, when Meowth begins capering around the field it is for real this time, with even another psychic jolt from its trainer not being enough to snap him out of it. Speaking out loud, the amalgam instructs Meowth to return, though unfortunately it is already too late for that, as Umbreon has already begun to capitalize charging up its largest dark pulse yet, which it unleashes on Meowth. In this vulnerable state, it hits Meowth like a truck, sending him skidding across across the ground with enough force to dig a trench in his wake, and leaving the scratch cat visibly worse for wear. The only benefit to that is Meowth manages to come back to his senses, and is very fortunate that he does, as it is at this exact moment that Lance chooses to attack. Having deemed this Ketchum's greatest moment of weakness, with his primary accomplice out of commission, Lance springs on the boy. Grabbing him in a headlock while seemingly out of nowhere, dozens of police officers appear to block every exit, with Erica, Looker, and Silver at their head. Furiously, Gary demands to know what Lance thinks he's doing. Though in a flat voice that carries none of the faux warmth he always exhibits when interacting with Gary in public, the Dragon Master states while he appreciates Gary for softening Ketchum up for him, putting down a monster like this is a champion's work. Speaking of champions, up in the top box, the visiting champions are all in a state of confusion, as Cynthia, along with Bruno and Laurel, are prepared to assist Lance if need be, while in contrast, Karen, Alder, and Pierce look as though they might attack their accomplices if they try it. There is even discord among our heroes, as Misty, Brock, and Deli are all vocal in their desire to go help Ash, while Oak warns them not to get involved, confidently assuring the group that what they think of as Ash is more than capable of handling himself. The only one who is truly conflicted is Richie, as he finds himself torn between his loyalty to both Ash and Silver, as it seems his two fellow sponsorship recipients are on opposite sides of the situation, making it impossible for him to choose one. Back on the field, Lance declares that Ash Ketchum is under arrest for the charges of racketeering and terrorism as an operative of the criminal organization Team Rocket. But when he says the boy's name again, the entity in his arms chuckles, stating that he is weary of saying he is not Ash Ketchum, and instead is simply the gray area between two lost souls. Though for short, the people of Kanto and the world may from now on call him Gray. Raising his hands, the newly christened Gray then blows his foes away, the psychic energy rippling out from him in similar ways that caused so much damage on New Island. Gary and Meowth are the only ones who are spared, with a pair bearing witness to a shocking sight, where Ash once stood now floats a figure greatly resembling Mewtwo, though where the clone was almost white with shades of pink. This creature is a slaty gray, with black and purple accents that create an unquantifiable air of menace, as he coldly surveys the assembled denizens of the Indigo Plateau. For a moment, it looks as though this gray creature wishes to say more, though as Meowth scrambles onto his shoulders looking haggard, the amalgam takes this as his cue to leave, while the Pokeballs of Ash catch him orbit around him vanishing at the same flash of light he has every other time he is teleported, bound for a destination only he knows. When the psychic storm has passed, Lance is the first to speak, running to the center of the battlefield and excitedly calling for everyone to congratulate Gary Oak for winning the Indigo League. 
frowning almost disgustedly. Gary wonders how Lance can expect everyone to act as though nothing just happened, though an attestment to the shallowness of people, or perhaps simply their need to have something to believe in. The audience erupt in thunderous applause, chanting the names of both Gary and Lance. Keeping that showman's voice, Lance then continues that this victory entitles him to a shot at the Elite Four, and possibly even the championship itself as Gary can fight his way to the top, something he's sure the Oak can manage, and not just because he is its student. All around them, Ash's friends hear laughter, as well as further cheers, the tension of a minute ago seemingly entirely forgotten by everyone but themselves, almost unnatural. However, in this moment, the heroes of course have no desire at all to laugh. Instead, each of them feels sick to their stomachs as they replay the departure of this gray in their minds, wondering where he is going now and what he intends to do next, finally believing his claims of not being Ash. Many miles above Kanto, a man sets about his work. As the only human inhabitant of his flying palace, it is always falls on him to do the higher order tasks, and today is no different with him poring over a series of maps and charts all projected around him by his airship's computer system. Though his client has apparently become indisposed, the man is not entirely displeased as now he will not need to share these most exquisite prizes, instead being able to keep them for himself. That is, if he can find them, which unfortunately is becoming a larger and larger if with each passing day, as even now his quarry is getting further and further away, desperate to avoid becoming part of his collection. Running a hand through his mantis-colored hair, Lawrence III lets out a sigh. Though he had not relished the thought of parting with his prizes, Giovanni's insight on the legendary birds and their keepers had been most illuminating, providing a shrewdly analytical element that raw data simply cannot. However, this is not the only frustration Lawrence has with the mafioso's disappearance, as on top of a sizable paycheck, Giovanni has had also promised him assistance from a personal protege, a rising star in Team Rocket who would have been able to help him acquire the birds quite easily. As if on cue, a flash of light catches Lawrence's peripheral vision, and as he turns to locate the source, he sees a young boy matching the description of the late Rocket boss's student exactly. In a voice that would be coy if not for the cold severity that hangs on every syllable, the boy quips that he is here exactly when Giovanni promised he would be. Figuring his arrival must have been facilitated by some covert piece of Devon Court technology, Lawrence greets him and says that this youth must be Ash, and that he is here to help him track down the legendary birds, is he not? However, with a slight frown, the boy retorts that he is wrong on both accounts. His name is Gray, and he has come here not to follow the Pokemon Hunter's orders, but to give them. As of now, Lawrence's contract with Team Rocket is null and void, meaning he is to delete the data he has received and cease his hunt for the legendary birds at once smirking in a way that says he believes this brat's impudence to be a poor attempt at humor. The green-haired man replies that even if Giovanni no longer requires his services, he has no intention of giving up his data or his hunt, as he will be adding Zapdos, Moltres, and Articuno to his personal collection. Frown definitely on his face now, as his reputation does not precede him. Gray informs the man that he was not asking, acid in his voice as he adds that Pokemon are not collectibles for selfish humans. Turning cold now as well, Lawrence retorts that the boy does not know what he is talking about, as anything can be collectible, so long as it has value to someone. He then returns to his maps, hoping the boy might be able to help him once he gets off his high ponyta. Though instead, young Grey walks to face him once more, his eyes faintly glowing as he scowls that it seems Lawrence is just like Giovanni after all. A moment later, a thud rings out through the room as the collector's body hits the marble floor, his eyes just as vacant and lifeless as Giovanni's had been at the end of their clash of wills. Feeling comfortable to speak now that this creep is dealt with, Meowth asks if there's any more business they need to attend to here, or if they can finally go back to the gym and get some rest. Though his gray manifests a cloak and mask to cover the visits he unwillingly stole from Ash Ketchum, he determinedly responds that they won't be returning to the gym for a while, as they still have one more of Ash's promises to keep before their real work can begin. And so, he takes control of the Flying Palace. We did it. Like 16 videos and over 14 hours worth of content. But we did it. I'm pretty overwhelmed with my own evolution here. Uh, anyway, I suppose I'm a being a bit insensitive to you guys, considering what you've just seen, the fact that I'm a little bit ahead of you in like where the story is. Uh, but like, yeah, like you guys have always had a strong inclination to our hero, Ash Ketchum, and his story and the story of his friends and family and all those who are connected to him is by no means done yet. It is, however, on break, like we're going to be when it comes to the actual narrating of the story, at least when it comes to upcoming Giovanni-sponsored Ash Universe projects. 
yeah, there's a lot coming down the line, including some stuff that Plus and I will be involved with that doesn't have anything to do with Ash or the legendary Pokemon and the fusion of those two that we've come to call Grey. But as we hinted at the start of the video, we won't be the ones that are telling you this story. So we're going to step aside and let the newest members of the GSA universe tell you all about the teaser that we promised. Since its collapse in the Kanto region, Team Rocket's global absence has stirred the criminal underworld into a frenzy, as conflict has now broken out in the neighboring Johto region to fill the void of power. Now, as the remnants of a once great empire descends into civil war, led by two mysterious new bosses, two unlikely heroes will unite and chase the phantom of a lost hero and a powerful Pokemon in pursuit of justice and redemption. The lightning quick-witted young man with a heart of gold, and his equally thunderous partner, whom bear a similar aura to one long lost. The cold, sharp, junior detective hell-bent on solving the mystery behind his best friend's disappearance to soothe his tarnished soul of silver alongside his roguish partner. Join, Join us, us, the, the Story Buster and, and Electro Pikachu. Pikachu. As, as we, we undertake, undertake the journey of the, the What If Giovanni-sponsored Ash Season 3, the HG SS Arc. Arc.